developments in the looting. So that's uh, what is happening in the US. Meanwhile, here in the UK, the latest round of Brexit talks are set to end on Friday with the possibility of the UK leaving the EU with no trade agreement looming. Bloomberg has learned that the EU is now pinning its hopes on a dramatic intervention by the Prime Minister. Boris Johnson is set to speak to EU leaders Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel later this month. He's likely to be told that the bloc can offer possible concessions if the UK does the same. Yeah, great piece by Ian Wishart on the terminal, but a line in there which I think is very telling. The UK government response is that all this is, quotes, wishful thinking. Well, we'll be digging into that in much more detail on British politics on the Bloomberg Westminster programme at 12 noon UK time. Today we're going to be speaking to the Liberal Democrat MP and spokesman for, spokesperson for business, trade and transport, that's Sarah Olney. We'll also be discussing how the reopening of some school classes this week has gone. We'll be talking to Simon Kidwell, who's head of the Hartford Manor Primary School and Nursery in Cheshire. You can catch that live on London DAB or download the podcast on Apple Music or your preferred radio app later. And to Germany now, where Chancellor Angela Merkel has failed to broker a deal on stimulus. It delays plans to spend as much as 100 billion euros to reboot Europe's biggest economy. Bloomberg's Arne Delfs has the story. The ruling coalition of her Christian Democratic Net Bloc and the Social Democrats didn't reach an agreement after nine hours of talks in Berlin. The parties will reconvene on Wednesday. After a brief period of unity at the height of the corona crisis, party differences are burdening the negotiations. Why the Social Democrats push for a family bonus and higher social spending, the Christian Democrats demand lower corporate taxes and a state subsidy for car sales. In Berlin, Arne Delfs, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. And in France, there won't be any tax hikes to pay for the pandemic stimulus. The finance minister, Bruno Le Maire, says taxes are already high and they won't increase the burden on the French people. The announcement comes as countries... ...grappling with exactly how to pay for the trillions that have been spent to protect jobs and companies. Meanwhile, in the oil markets, Brent crude futures have increased to more than $40 a barrel for the first time since March. It's on signs that OPEC and its allies are close to agreeing a short extension of their historic output cuts. Bloomberg has learned that Russia and several other members are in favour of extending the curbs by one month. Saudi Arabia is in favour of one to three months. Yeah, and right now, Brent's $40.24 the barrel, WTI 37.71. Right, let's get the latest global news from Leanne Gerrans. And Leanne, you begin in the US. Yes, Roger, good morning. Democratic Party donors are pouring money into Joe Biden's election campaign as protests continue to gain momentum across the country. Two fundraisers say President Donald Trump's response to the demonstrations and violence is motivating donors to give even more support to Biden. Biden's fundraising has trailed Trump whose re-election effort has raised $742 million in the last 16 months. Now the killing in the U.S. of an unarmed black man by a white police officer is also sparking outrage across sub-Saharan Africa. From Cape Town, Bloomberg's Mike Cohen reports. Protests have been staged in Kenya and Nigeria, and several political leaders have voiced stinging criticism. They include Ghana's president, Nana Kufa Addo, who says black people the world over are shocked and distraught about the killings. The objections are all the more stinging, given that many African nations have been at the receiving end of U.S. criticism for violating their own citizens' rights. In Cape Town, Mike Cohen, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Here in the UK, if you are of Bangladeshi origin, you are around twice as likely to die from coronavirus than if you are white. Bloomberg's Charles Cable has all those details. That's according to a report released by Public Health England that found people from ethnic minority groups face a higher risk of dying from the disease. The report says a higher probability of living in large households, holding jobs that expose them to the virus, and living in densely populated areas increase the risk minority groups face. Being male, elderly, or living in poverty also makes a person more vulnerable. In London, Charles Capel, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. After almost three months of restrictions, Italians are today finally allowed to travel freely around the country. Bloomberg's Flavia Rutondi has... There will not be a need to submit a form in order to leave their region. They will be able to visit relatives and friends. Italy will also allow Europeans to enter the country, a move that will help the tourist sector, which accounts for about 13% of the Italian GDP. In Rome, Flavia Rutondi, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.
global news 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Caroline. Thank you so much, Leanne. Now, the morning sports news and uh, cricket returns. Here's Joe Wilson. England cricket captain Joe Root could miss the first test of the summer because it may clash with the birth of his second child. The ECB have announced that the first of three matches against West Indies will take place in Southampton on the 8th of July. The bio-secure bubble at the venue means Root would not be able to go back and forward to hospital during a five-day match. Meanwhile, the Premier League has given clubs permission to play friendly matches before fixtures restart on the 17th of June. However, there will be a number of safety restrictions restrictions in place and everyone involved must have tested negative for coronavirus and Frankie de Tori won on his return to horse racing yesterday the legendary jockey rode Galsworthy to victory at Kempton there's another card at the Surrey track today with the Unibet Classic Trail the big race of the afternoon that was Joe Rawson with all the latest sport now coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. We're going to keep you up with the latest on the protests that have been rocking America over eight days now. The National Guard's been deployed in Washington, D.C. as the protests continue. President Trump is also drawing criticism from both sides of the aisle for abuse of power. Very interesting. Pat Robertson, not normally an enemy of the president, has been extremely critical of him. Will he get all the very latest live from New York? on what's happening there, where we understand that the mayor has asked Uber and Lyft and other hiring companies to change their policies to try and avoid losing. This is Daybreak Europe. This is Bloomberg. Business is constantly evolving. Is your financial printer evolving to keep ahead of the curve? At Command Financial, we are redefining financial printing by providing industry-leading expertise, leveraging technology, and honing processes and best practices. Every day, Command helps SEC registrants, as well as members of their working groups, including securities attorneys and investment bankers, prepare, file, and disseminate regulatory and disclosure documents, such as registration statements, M&A documents, and mutual fund prospectuses and reports. Command provides a full range of services to help you effectively complete your deal, meet your disclosure requirements, and achieve your shareholder communications objectives. Visit our website at commandfinancial.com and learn how we're evolving, not only with the times, but also with your business requirements. Command Financial, redefining financial printing. Are you looking for senior care for your mom or dad but don't know where to start? Hi, I'm Joan London with A Place for Mom. Nobody knows your parent or loved one better than you, and nobody knows senior living better than the experts at A Place for Mom. It's a free service, and we've helped thousands of families find the right place for their mom or dad. There's a place for answers, a place for mom. Call today. Call a place for mom at 1-800-391-1755. That's 1-800-391-1755. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Influential conversations from Bloomberg Television. Here's Sherry Ann. U.S. stocks rose for a third day on Tuesday amid positive economic signals as the virus lockdowns ease. This despite tensions and protests continuing across the country. Joining us now to discuss is Main State Capital Management founder, CEO, and chief investment strategist, David Kudla. David, great to have you with us. We continue to hear about this disconnect between the real world and the markets. How long are we expected to continue seeing this? And what questions does this give rise to? when it comes to valuations. Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, when we, we turn on the TV or we, we hear the news we, on social media, uh, you know, we, would, we see what's happening in the country here, and it's, you know, uh, a lot like what we've, we've seen in, in Hong Kong over the past year uh, with, you know, the, the, the riots that are, that are going on in 140 cities across the U.S., 4,400 people arrested, uh, we now have 29 states that have called in their National Guard. 40 cities have implemented curfews, and it's almost as if 
uh, it's almost ignored by the, the stock markets because it, it, the U.S. stock markets have continued to advance in spite of it. So, you know, when we talk about that disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street, uh, we're seeing it once again. Hear more interviews like this one on Bloomberg Television, streaming live on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg mobile app, or check your local cable listings. And as obligations. Markets, headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app and on QuickTake by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Good morning from London. I'm Sandra Kilhoff with this Bloomberg Business Flash. And we get we begin with some breaking news that Spain's services PMI has risen to 27.9. That's above the forecast of 25. The composite PMI coming in at 29.2, slightly better than expected. So some interesting data coming out of Spain there. Of course, we will be getting PMIs out of France, Italy, and Germany throughout this hour. So lots to keep an eye on there as we assess the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the European economy. Now, we we are about 17 minutes into the European opening, and we're seeing the stock 600 up 1%. Similarly, so for the FTSE, the DAX gaining 1.3% in Frankfurt. U.S. futures also pointing higher following a similarly positive trading day in Asia this morning. The bullish investor sentiment is pushing the dollar to its lowest level since late March. The Bloomberg dollar spot index sliding four tenths of a percent. We are seeing the yen holding around 108 spot seven, but sterling bid now trading above 126, up half a percent. The euro gaining above. 112 at the moment. We are seeing the Korean won rally this morning on the back of a $29 billion budget to shore up the economy coming out of Seoul this morning. The Aussie, however, trading below 70 following the first quarterly GDP drop since 2011. Over in the fixed income markets, we are seeing treasuries dip, sending the 10-year yield higher by two basis points to 70 basis points. Similarly so for 10-year bun yields. They're currently at negative 38. 10-year gilt yields gaining two basis points to 25 basis points this morning. Morning. Gold is slightly lower at $1,722 a troy ounce, but we are seeing crude extend its rebound as investors eye a potential extension to OPEC plus curbs. Brent trading above 40 WTI at $37 a barrel. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Thank you, Leanne Garrins, with more on what's going on around the world. Sandra, thank you. President Trump says the Republican Party has been forced to seek a new city for its national convention. It's been planned for Charlotte, North Carolina, but the president doesn't w- does want it moved due to coronavirus restrictions put in place by the state's governor. The president didn't definitely say the GOP were pulling out of Charlotte and didn't definitely say which other cities were under consideration. In the US, there's been a surge in attacks on journalists or other violations of press freedom since Friday. The Freedom of the Press Foundation says it has received more than 190 claims, including physical assault, arrest, damage or seizure of equipment. There is usually 100 to 100 150 claims a year. The uptick comes as reporters cover the protests against police brutality in the U.S. in response to the murder of George Floyd. And Brazil had a record day of coronavirus deaths. Latin America's largest economy reported more than 1,200 new fatalities yesterday. That brought the total number of dead to almost 32,000. Brazil has become the regional epicenter of the disease in the last few weeks. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Caroline. Thank you so much, Eliane Gaines, with the World News. Now, I want to continue our coverage uh, for you of the U.S. protests. Uh, we have uh, been covering them live all morning from San Francisco, from Washington, D.C., and now we're going to get the latest from New York. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern is standing by. Thousands of protesters, Anne-Marie, have defied the curfews in big towns and cities. The unrest has gripped the nation now for more than a week. Were more of these protests peaceful overnight? And why might that be? Have there been stricter uh, rules here, Anne-Marie? Yeah, that's exactly right. These curfews, I think, started to calm down some of the vandalism and looting we saw saw that was not part of the peaceful protest. And largely last night, now I say this largely, obviously there's incidents uh, throughout throughout the United States, but largely the protests were peaceful. Um, Some clashes with law enforcement near the White House, though, in D.C., that is something that has been on the radar. But mostly these were peaceful protests. I have to say, Monday evening, though, 
what I saw was definitely more of the looting and vandalism side. And then today, when I was walking through Manhattan, store after store, if they weren't already boarded up, construction workers were outside. The Apple Store on Fifth, I saw them today bordering up that huge glass um, mm. storefront in that box. So it's definitely more of a, of a peaceful tone. And here in New York, the curfew is actually extending. It's extending through Monday morning. And that Monday morning is, of course, when New York City is supposed to reopen from the lockdown of the virus. Mm. Got lots of things happening there, not least also this n- n- number we've seen now. Oh, almost 10,000 people arrested overall uh, as a result of the protest. But Anne-Marie, what about the politics of all this? Because Joe Biden has emerged and has been speaking. Yeah, he spoke yesterday from Philadelphia. And I like how you say he's emerged because he has been basically sequestered in his home due to the pandemic. Um, And what he talked about yesterday was one thing he jumped on was, of course, um, there's been a lot of backlash with the president and what happened in Washington, D.C., with the protest in Lafayette Park, walking through that park, and then uh, what many are saying, brandishing the Bible. That's the words Joe Biden used. Um, And he said that he used this, saying Trump, saying that Trump opened his Bible. Uh, If he's opened his Bible instead of brandishing it, he could have learned something. I mean, he's calling on the president Uh, And he's saying a president needs to be part of the resolution and not accelerate it. And what this all basically means for the politics side is that right now we are seeing an uptick with Biden in the polls. 47% of voter support versus Trump with 37% 37%, according to a Reuters Ipsos poll. And then one thing that I think is very interesting, and it's a bit alarming when you're looking at an incoming president, this kind of question that was put to a survey, and it was whether or not the country is on the wrong track. And 74% said yes earlier this week in a Mound Month University released poll. So all of this is obviously playing into what happens on November 3rd. Yeah, of course. So then what are uh, President Donald Trump's uh, options now to address the nationwide address, uh, the nationwide unrest? I note also that the Floyd family themselves have been protesting too in Houston. Yeah, we've seen pro- yeah we've seen protests in Houston. Um, there's been this video I really seen circulating a lot on social media of uh, Floyd's daughter saying that his, her dad is now changed the world. Um, what? is left for President Trump now is we know that this option he has in terms of wanting to use military force would be this 1807 insurrection law. The last time we saw this, which basically allows the uh, the president without congressional approval to employ the military for domestic use. We saw this in 1992, the Los Angeles Rodney King riots. That was under George H.W. Bush. But a big note there is that Bush acted in response to requests to the governors. Right now, not a single governor is asking for that. Um, so he's getting a lot of advice from Attorney General uh, William Barr. But without the government support, that's going to be very hard for the president to do. He's got a lot of difficult questions ahead, I think. Very interestingly, of course, the military line. We've seen the Pentagon moving troops into bases in the D.C. region, not on the streets. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. As U.S. businesses closed to curb the spread of the coronavirus, more than 40 million Americans were left unemployed. Are the worst of the job losses now behind us? ADP will have its monthly look at private employment today. It's expected to show 9 million jobs lost in May. As the economy begins to recover, David Costin at Goldman Sachs says the back-to-work trend will be the thing to watch. How quickly, hopefully it will be quickly, but how quickly and how many, what percentage of those individuals who have been laid off or furloughed will be rehired by their employers? Investors will also be watching a monthly measure of service sector activity for signs of a turnaround. It's expected to show improvement in May, though not return to growth. Some well-known retailers will post their quarterly results today, and we'll see how stay-at-home orders have impacted them. American Eagle Outfitters, Canada Goose, and Vera Bradley open their books before the market opens. Larry Kofsky, Bloomberg Radio. With COVID-19, so much is unknown. Is this the worst you've seen? But we are committed to getting you every piece of information we can as soon as we can. Tell us about this first big win you have. What is it, 24 million N95 masks? Fewer unknowns. Who's winning here? Where is the pressure right now? That's our goal. What worries you the most? The time it's going to take for a vaccine? Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. What happens next when a downturn looms? 
Shareholders turned to the C-suite to maintain profitability. And for two decades, the leaders of Fortune 500 and Global 2000 companies have turned to GEP for results. GEP's procurement and supply chain solutions help reduce costs, improve performance, and boost EBITDA. GEP helps great companies stay on track and primed for the next phase of the business cycle. GEP, helping the world's best companies do better. We're Cadent. Keeping you and our people safe is our main focus, and our vital work must continue. You'll start to see more of us in your area as we increase our work to upgrade the gas pipes to keep the energy flowing into your homes and businesses. We may need to come into your home to complete this work, but rest assured our engineers are following all government guidance on PPE and social distancing. We continue to provide the critical gas emergency service, and if you smell gas, call 0800 111 To all other key workers, we would like to say a big thank you from everyone at Cadent. Cadent, your gas network. You know that feeling when you get more than you expected? Like discovering that the box of chocolates has a whole other layer underneath? Or scoring extra poppadoms with your takeaway? Or joining Tesco Mobile and finding out you get the latest phones and 99% UK network coverage? Yeah, that moment feels good, right? Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. 99% 4G population coverage indoors and outdoors across UK. This is a message from the government about the emergency measures to support the economy during the period of disruption caused by the coronavirus. To help you, your business, and your workers affected, you can apply for cash grants, business rate holidays, statutory sick pay relief packages, as well as the coronavirus job retention and self-employment income support schemes. For information, go to gov.uk forward slash business dash support now. If you can build that flat pack wardrobe without looking at the instructions, you've still got it. If you can manage five keepy uppies on your first go, you've without question still got it. If you can toss a pancake to the ceiling and not let it hit the floor, surely you've still got it. And if you can just about fit into those jeans you bought five years ago, you've definitely still got it. Brute, still got it. Where will 2020 take you? Somewhere where people care. About each other. About our planet. About creating a better world for everyone. And becoming the best versions of yourselves. Join a community of like-minded individuals at the University of Winchester. Make sure to accept your offer by the UCAS deadline and visit our website to find out more. See the bigger picture. Be the difference. Go to winchester.ac.uk. Broadcasting live to London on DAB Digital Radio. To New York, Bloomberg 1130. To Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 991. To Boston, Bloomberg 1061. To San Francisco, Bloomberg 960. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. A very good morning from London. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Roger Hearing, and you're listening to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. So in the markets this morning, significant gains in Europe again. Uh, so up by 1% this morning, even uh, as European equities hit a three-month high yesterday, the optimism uh, continues uh, about reopening and recovery. The Zetradax gains 1.4%. The CAC aren't up a similar amount. This, as we see, uh, US futures, Roger, also higher, despite the unrest on the streets uh, of America, really across major cities and towns in the US that we've been reporting on all morning. The S&P 500, even futures gain four tenths of one percent uh, right now as for the bond markets uh, at the minute the ecb decision is really going to be critical tomorrow for those negative 38 basis points for german yield so up by three and a half basis points italian btp yields at 152 so also up two points and uh, 70 basis points for uh, u.s yields right now this of course is germany um, is going to continue discussions amongst uh, its lawmakers about an another second stimulus package uh, in excess of 100 billion euros. So that could be a big story again for Europe's biggest economy. Also, I note that the Bloomberg dollar spot index is weakening further, four tenths of 1%, and that we do stick above $40 a barrel for Brent crude, $40.20, so up by 1.6% right now. Those are the markets, Roger. 
Right, let's move on to some of today's top stories. Now, unrest has continued across the U.S. overnight. President Donald Trump's come under harsh criticism, too, for his response to the demonstrations. We spoke to Bloomberg reporter John Harney in D.C. earlier this morning. He's been criticized by church leaders. He's also come under criticism from an unusual uh, source, Pat Robertson, the televangelist whose viewers are overwhelmingly Trump supporters. Even he thought that Trump overreacted and uh, was all wrong in his uh, response to the protest. And some Republicans have edged away from him as well. So it hasn't been a good 24 hours. And Trump isn't getting the backing of local state governors either over his offer to send in the military to prevent looting. Thousands ignored curfews last night also as peaceful marches and vandalism continued. And it will continue our uh, live coverage for you all throughout the morning from John Harney in D.C. We also spoke to Anne-Marie Hordern in New York and uh, to Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. So we'll bring you uh, all of the latest lines on that. Meanwhile, let's also tell you a bit about what's happening for the U.K. The latest round of Brexit talks are set to end on Friday with the possibility of the U.K. leaving the EU with no trade agreement looming. Bloomberg, though, has learned that the EU is now pinning its hopes on a dramatic intervention by the U.K. Prime Minister. Boris Johnson is set to speak with EU leader, uh, leaders Ursula von der Leyen and also Charles Michel later this month. He's likely to be told that the bloc can offer possible concessions if the UK does the same. Yeah, but interestingly, the uh, Bloomberg reporting suggests that the UK government sees all that as, quotes, wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, in top corporate news, Zoom has transformed the hype into a huge jump in sales and customers. The virtual meeting software company says the revenue soared the most in the recent quarter. Zoom has now boosted its annual sales forecast. It's become an essential service, attracting more than 300 million participants in some days. That's up from 10 million in December. Wow, big numbers. And meanwhile, Tiffany shares took a dive yesterday. That's after Women's Wear Daily reported uh, that the deal with LVMH may be uncertain. The luxury giant is apparently concerned about the impact of coronavirus and the pandemic on the U.S. economy and growing unrest across America. There's been no comment to Bloomberg from either Tiffany or LVMH. Well, let's move on to airlines. And Wizz Air's full-year revenue has matched expectations, coming in at 2.76 billion euros. But as the industry battles with the impact of the virus, the low-cost airline also said it doesn't expect an improvement in its profit margin going forward. Bloomberg's Anna Edwards and Matt Miller spoke exclusively to Wizz Air's CEO. Here's a Ferrari about the company's outlook. We are actually very pleased with the results that uh, we are bringing to the market today. Uh, obviously, today we are in a totally different position, totally different situation, given um, you know the COVID-19 impact on the uh, on the industry. Uh, so it's hard to predict what exactly to uh, to expect from the current year. I think we are very much down to uh, government discretions, how various restrictions are imposed on the industry, on people's movement, um, and uh, depending on that, uh, we will see how we can uh, uh, go through this uh, this year. But our understanding of the market is that actually people have the desire to travel. They want to fly and, uh, you know, they've got enough of having been locked down for uh, two to three months. So uh, we are doing all sorts of demand sensing and, uh, and that suggests that actually people want to move. Last time we spoke to you, we talked about expansion plans. You've certainly been talking to our colleagues about that, around new bases and around new routes, which, which might surprise many people. But today you talk about how you don't see a positive development in terms of capacity. Give us, can you give us any guidance as to what capacity will do this year then? Well, you know, what I can tell you is that uh, we have a desperate quarter uh, we are in. So this is the April room quarter. We're going to be flying around 15% of our total capacity. Uh, we hope to do significantly better in the following quarter. We sense that there is a turning point now in Europe. June might be the month that many other countries will uh, start easing restrictions uh, significantly. So we are expecting a much better quarter. So roughly 50-60% of the capacity we are planning on flying. And depending on how life moves on, uh, we would expect to, uh, to ramp up to around 80% in the second half of our financial year. Now, this is all subject to government restrictions, I have to emphasize. But, I mean, when you look at, for example, other markets that have opened up, Joseph, I saw charts today of China that I think substantiated kind of your forecast, looking at an, a rebound to 80, 85% of uh, previous activity. Is that what you expect for the rebound here in Europe as well? Yes, absolutely. Uh, this is what I would be um, uh, expecting. Um, I mean, again, you know, pe people want to go, people want to fly. 
Uh, I think that is demand there, and that demand can be further stimulated by low fares. And I think we have a perfect business model uh, to, uh, to to do so. But we need to see the government restrictions going away uh, in order to be able to fly people. Uh, but but definitely, I think the industry will recover. But different players in the industry will uh, recover differently. Uh, we are a low cost, very efficient point to point business. We recover much quicker than uh, the, the hub and spoke carriers who are much relying on long call travel. I think long call will have some time to, uh, uh, to go before uh, it gets back to normal. And that was Wizz Air CEO Josef Faradi speaking exclusively to Bloomberg. Yeah, interesting that uh, a couple of the big winners uh, in Europe as the lockdown unwinds could well be Wizz Air and uh, Ryanair. You know, Wizz Air just a month ago talking about adding new hubs, uh, adding new flights, uh, certainly out of Eastern Europe. So good to have that CEO interview this morning. Let's take you now uh, to Bloomberg's uh, Leanne Gerrans, who's standing by with all the latest in terms of global news. Good morning. Caroline, good morning. And thank you. Democratic Party donors are pouring money into Joe Biden's election campaign as protests continue to gain momentum across the U.S. Two fundraisers say President Donald Trump's response to the demonstrations and violence is motivating donors to give even more support to Biden. Biden's fundraising has trailed Trump, whose re-election effort has raised $742 million in the last 16 months. The U.S. ambassador in Australia says his country is committed to protecting journalists. This comes after a television crew from Australia was assaulted by police while covering a peaceful street demonstration in Washington. Bloomberg's Jason Scott reports. Television footage on Monday in the U.S. showed a cameraman and reporter from Australia's Channel 7 network being struck by police while live on air ahead of President Donald Trump's walk to a church near the White House. U.S. Ambassador Arthur B. Culverhouse Jr. said in a statement issued late Tuesday that his nation takes mistreatment of journalists seriously. In Canberra, Jason Scott Bloomberg, Daybreak Europe. Meanwhile, here in the UK, if you are of Bangladeshi origin, you are around twice as likely to die from coronavirus than if you are white. That is according to a report released by Public Health England that found people from ethnic minority groups face a higher risk of dying from the disease. Being male, elderly or living in poverty also makes a person more vulnerable. And Spain's reported no deaths from coronavirus for a second consecutive day. Bloomberg's Charlie Deverick says the country remains on track to lift the lockdown by the end of this month. About 70% of Spain entered phase two of a phased de-escalation this week, with the remainder hoping to join them next Monday. The government is trying to balance avoiding further damage to its battered tourism industry while trying to minimise the risk of another outbreak of the virus, which has killed more than 27,000 people. In Madrid, this is Charlie Deverex for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Roger. Leanne, thanks for that. Now, coming up on Daybreak Europe, we're going to be talking to Paul Donovan, Global Chief Economist at UBS, getting a sense of where the markets are going and are they getting it right? Because there certainly seems to be an element of optimism out there this morning as we look across the European stock 600 up one point. 1% 1%, FTSE 100 up just over 1%, CAC up 1.5%, the DAX up 1.6%, and the IBEX up just over 1% as well. Of course, we had the uh, Spanish PMIs out just uh, a little while ago, again, giving a sense that things may be turning the corner. Also looking to the US opening, again, we're seeing uh, green on the screen there, optimism, S&P 500 up 4 tenths of 1%, the Dow up 6 tenths of 1%, and the NASDAQ up almost 0.4% as well. That's uh, all coming up here on Daybreak Europe. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. When you went car shopping, you meant business. You ace vehicle history searches and test drives. You out salesmen to the salesman. Now you've got your wheels. If you manage that, you can get your retirement plan on track. Visiting aceyourretirement.org can help. With 401k tips and smart saving strategies, you'll have the info you need to get more for your future. Go to aceyourretirement.org because when it comes to speeding past financial challenges, you're an ace. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. The Boston Symphony Orchestra presents BSO at Home. While you stay inside, enjoy a curated collection of archived concerts and behind-the-scenes stories from BSO musicians. 
BSO Homeschool provides lessons for music lovers of all ages. New performances and messages from musicians are added regularly. Enjoy these selections and much more at bso.org slash at home. Hey y'all, Jeff Foxworthy here. Now if you've ever found yourself repeating the same thing over and over for 75 years, you might be Smokey Bear. Only you can prevent wildfires. That's why I'm filling in for Smokey to switch things up. Because there's a lot more to say. And I should know because my grandfather was a firefighter. And one of the things he taught me is that the people that love the outdoors the most are often the ones accidentally starting wildfires. Which means always (laughs) B-Y-O-B. No, bring your own bucket to the campfire. And be extra careful with things like burning yard trimmings. Don't just walk away or chances are you might be starting a wildfire. So for the love of the outdoors, go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Have you wanted to... You know that feeling when you get more than you expected? Like discovering that the box of chocolates has a whole other layer underneath? Or scoring extra poppadoms with your takeaway? Or joining Tesco Mobile and finding out you get the latest phones and 99% UK network coverage. Yeah, that moment feels good, right? Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. 99% 4G population coverage indoors and outdoors across UK. Picture this. Small businesses on eBay are working to... Get things moving. Sending spices to novice cooks. Airbags to kids. Desks for home offices. Delivering the goods. Shipping footballs. Fruit trees. And dishwashers. Thousands of small businesses on eBay are helping to keep the nation going. They are individually brilliant, stronger as one. Buy, sell, eBay. This is a message from the government about the next stage of controlling coronavirus with NHS Test and Trace. To protect your friends and family, testing and tracing must become a new way of life. If you have symptoms, you need to get a test immediately. Don't leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, we will contact you to trace people who you might have infected. From now on, if you're told you've been exposed to an infected person, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Play your part and do the right thing so we can safely return to a more normal life. Go to nhs.uk or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. Whoa, just got a moon pig reminder that it's your birthday Saturday. Yeah, I set that up. Oh, do you know what? I forget one time. Okay, I'm in the app. Oh, the romantic card section. I'm full of surprises. Now, what rhymes with babe? How about just uploading a nice pic? No, wait, I'm not ready. Hey, I love you from every angle. Now for the gifts. Oh, and flowers. Heartfelt can happen anywhere with Moonpig.com. Download the app now. You love tune in for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on tune in. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. It's TuneIn Sports on this day. On this day in 1980, the New York Mets draft Daryl Strawberry at age 18. Here's Daryl warming up their third pitcher. Well hit to left center field. Out of here, Daryl Strawberry's first Major League home run. Oh, Strawberry my. goes to the opposite power alley with great authority. It's a two-run home run. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. The Woj Pod with Adrian Wojnarowski. Doris, you had reason to believe that you needed to get a test for the coronavirus. Right. Well, I mean, let's just start with the headline, which is I did test positive for COVID-19. I was so tired from Saturday the 14th through Tuesday, March 17th. I kid you not, I could not be out of bed for five minutes without needing to go back to bed and lay down. Search the Woj Pod to listen. 
With the NHL season temporarily on ice, now is a good time to catch up on past games. With Game Replay on TuneIn, you can hear every matchup of the 2019-2020 season so far. And for a limited time, it's free for hockey fans everywhere. Search Classic Game Replays to start listening. Instant breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on QuickTake by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Good morning from London. I'm Sandra Kilhoff with this Bloomberg Business Flash. We are seeing the rally in global equity markets continuing again today. The Stock 600 and the FTSE both up 1%. The DAX surging 1.7% in Frankfurt. And U.S. futures also firmly in the green. It follows a similarly positive trading day in Asia where the Hang Seng is currently up 1.3%. Now, the bullish investor sentiment is pushing the dollar to its lowest level since late March. The Bloomberg Dollar Spot Index now down three tenths of a percent. The yen a bit weaker as well, down one tenth at 108 spot eight. We're seeing sterling bid, however, well above 125 now. The euro gaining four tenths of a percent at 112 this morning. Um, we have also seen the Korean won rally to a three week high after South Korea's government announced another $29 billion budget to shore up the economy. But the Aussie is trading below 70 after its first quarterly GDP drop since 2011. Over in the fixed income markets, we're seeing Treasuries dip, sending the 10-year yield to set up to 70 basis points. 10-year bond yields also gaining to negative 39. 10-year gilt yields at 24 basis points, up two basis points at the moment. Gold slightly weaker at $1,722 a troy ounce, but we are seeing crude very bid, extending its rebound as investors eye a potential extension to OPEC plus curbs. WTI at $37 a barrel, Brent trading above 40. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Now here's Ann Garrens with more on what's going on around the world. Sandra, thank you. President Donald Trump says a Republican Party has been forced to seek a new city for its national convention. It's been planned for Charlotte, North Carolina, but the president wants it moved due to coronavirus restrictions put in place by the state's governor. The president didn't definitely say the GOP were pulling out of Charlotte and didn't say which other cities were under consideration. India's financial capital is bracing for a rare and severe cyclone en route to Mumbai. Nasaga has winds of up to 120 kilometers per hour, with torrential rain and sea surges also expected. Mumbai, which is facing the brunt of the coronavirus crisis in India, is moving patients to safer places from vulnerable hospitals. And finally, Sweden's top epidemiologist has admitted his strategy to fight COVID-19 has resulted in too many deaths. And as Tegnell told Swedish radio, that if he had the knowledge he has now, the response would have been somewhere between Sweden's approach and what the rest of the world did. Tegnell is the brain behind Sweden's controversial approach to fighting the virus, which has kept restaurants, shops and some schools open. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Jan Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Roger. Leanne, thanks for that. And just some breaking news that's been coming over the term of the last few moments. PMIs, Italian PMIs, we had the Spanish ones earlier. Italy has also seen uh, a rise, a rise to 33.9 for composite PMI. The forecast was 28.5. And services PMI uh, has risen to 28.9. Again, the forecast was 26.1. So some pleasing beats on uh, PMI there. Right, let's uh, now talk about the global equity market. It's continued the upward surge this morning as investors focus on fresh stimulus from the likes of South Korea and the reopening of European economies. But this comes even as Germany's much-anticipated stimulus has run into some troubles and delays. And also, of course, there are those violent protests continuing across the U.S. For more, let's bring in Paul Donovan, Global Chief Economist at UBS. Paul, welcome to the program. Uh, Good morning to you and thanks for being with us. Now, you argue that the economic bounce back is rather dependent on keeping fear as low as possible. And yet, you'd think, looking across what's happening, there's quite good reasons for fear. Well, essentially what we've got is during the period of lockdown, people, particularly middle and higher income people, were forced to save money. And when you look at the breakdown of of what's been affected with spending uh, versus income, people have been saving somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of their income during lockdown. Now, They're going to go out and spend that money only when I think they feel confident that their jobs are safe 
and that the uh, the virus is contained. If they do have that confidence, if, if what you know, Lord Keynes called animal spirits is there, then that will go out and support the economy. But if they're worried on either of those counts, then they're going to keep hold of those savings as savings. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean... That's true. So then what about um, the markets? You know, the, the optimism in the markets uh, is huge. Most investors seem to be um, certainly not focused on the unrest, on the risks in the markets right now. Well, what, what we have to remember, I think, is that the, the equity markets are not the same thing as the economy. Sure. Um, so we've got a number of factors that we've got to consider here. Firstly, um, a lot of companies are global. They've got global revenue streams. Um, so they're not tied into any one specific market. Obviously, some are, but for, for most markets, you know, a majority of companies have got global revenue streams. Um, second, we've got to remember that, that larger companies are probably better positioned to ride out this situation um, as we come through the virus uh, than a small businesses. So, you know, larger companies will tend to have more cash available. They've got access to more um, financial resources. So that's all also helping uh, in terms of, of their performance. Um, and so I think what you were going to see is as we go into the bounce back phase, um, listed equity companies will outperform the economy because the economy, as it were, is going to be held back a bit by the small and medium-sized business sector because of the nature of this crisis, uh, whereas the large listed companies are going to be better positioned, I think. Now, another interesting aspect of this is in the fixed income area, Paul. I mean, we've seen this morning uh, yields uh, rising in, on, on most uh, government bonds that we follow and a sense that perhaps this is going to be the future. We've seen, obviously, historically uh, low yields coming through. Where do you, where do you sense that the bonds are going? Well, so I think over time, yes, we will probably be seeing higher yields, but... Uh, and, and this is a very important caveat. I strongly suspect that the way that governments are going to react to the debt is with financial repression. So that is to say a tax on savers and financial institutions, but a very discreet tax. You use regulatory powers to force financial institutions into buying government bonds a lower yield than they would otherwise wish to accept. And it's happened all the time already. I mean, if you look at bank reserve requirements, that's effectively forcing banks to hold bonds. Now, what this does is uh, it won't stop a rise in yields, because from where we are now, I think this is an extreme position, um, but it will make sure that yields stay relatively low and certainly below where you know, uh, uh, an economic model might say they would be. How concerned are you about the hit uh, and the potential for a second wave of coronavirus? I know that we're all sort of cheering and pleased that at least uh, the first phase may be coming to an end despite the kind of devastation. At least economies are, un are unlocking, right? But, but what about the fear and the risk and how you see it in terms of more uh, of the health crisis? Well, we come back to fear. So you know, the virus itself does remarkably little economic damage. What matters is fear of the virus. So when we're talking about a second wave in terms of, of the virus as a medical problem, that's one issue. But then if we see um, fear of the virus rising, people changing their behavior, becoming more conservative um, in terms of spending habits, companies becoming more cautious in terms of investing, that's where the real economic damage comes in. Now, my view is that I think that, that we're unlikely to see a second wave of fear of the virus uh, coming through. Um, I think that people have not necessarily become used to it, but become um, perhaps a, a, a little desensitized to the incremental news flow. So, yes, you know, if we get a second wave, obviously that would be very bad news, but I don't think that people would necessarily react the way they did the first time. Novelty always has a, a bigger impact, and we've seen this with other um, you know, human tragedies in the past uh, on a wide variety of indicators, terrorist attacks, things like that. After the first shock, 
people adapt. And I think it is worth reminding ourselves that, you know, people are extremely resilient. We always underestimate how well people adapt to changing circumstances. So in a second wave, I think people's fear would be different and probably significantly less because they have adapted during the course of the first wave. Now, Paul, I mean, let me bring you some, some data breaking across the, the term in the last few moments. Germany's May services PMI, 32.6. The prelim was 31.4. France May services PMI, 31.1. The preliminary was 29.4. And German unemployment rises by 238,000 uh, instead of an estimate of 190,000 increase. So, I mean, in Europe, we're seeing a lot of contrary data. But briefly, Paul, do you sense that the amount of stimulus, the amount of action by governments that's going on in Europe is going to be enough to turn the corner. So I think it is, yes. I mean, it, it's almost inevitable we get a third quarter bounce back. Uh, I mean, it, it would take remarkable policy mistakes not to get a third quarter bounce back. We've got these savings. People want to spend. People want to go back to normal. So I think, yes, we're on route. And I think that Europe, through its handling of the labor market, has done a lot to control fear of unemployment. Hmm. Okay, uh, we shall see uh, whether that continues that way. Paul Donovan, thank you so much for joining us, Global Chief Economist at UBS. Yes, uh, Paul, I think of sounding quite positive, Roger, as the markets reflect, really, um, that after the first shock, perhaps, that uh, the pandemic concern will be absorbed by people, by companies. US stock 600 right now up by 1.1% uh, this morning. Coming up in the next hour of Bloomberg Daybreak Year, Matt Miller will be joining joining me uh, here for Daybreak Europe. And we're going to get the latest, of course, on the US protests. And we will also speak to Simon French, the chief economist at Pan Muir Gordon. Get his view. Your virtual quiz team is demanding a rematch. And one more episode just isn't enough. You need loads of data. Get a massive 30 gig for £10 a month from Smarty Mobile. With no speed restrictions, unlimited calls and texts, and a flexible one-month plan, it's no wonder you switch awarded Smarty Best Values SIM Only Network 2020. Search Smarty. Simple, honest mobile. See smarty.co.uk. This is a message from the government about the next stage of controlling coronavirus with NHS Test and Trace. To protect your friends and family, testing and tracing must become a new way of life. If you have symptoms, you need to get a test immediately. Don't leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, we will contact you to trace people who you might have infected. From now on, if you're told you've been exposed to an infected person, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Play your part and do the right thing so we can safely return to a more normal life. Go to nhs.uk or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus save lives. You love tune in for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on tune in. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Dot com on the Bloomberg Business app and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. The idea is to really hold the economy in suspended animation until we get control of this virus. We are very much in a picture of monetary dominance. We will get slower growth. I mean, let's not get confused about that. We are in a national crisis. I think it is for all parties to pull together. The euro area is facing an economic contraction of a magnitude and speed that are unprecedented in peacetime. Bloomberg Daybreak Europe on Bloomberg Radio. A very good morning from London. I'm Caroline Hepke. And good morning from the Bloomberg Bureau in Berlin. I'm Matt Miller. You're listening to Daybreak Europe on London DAB Digital Radio. So, look, there's no avoiding uh, the big uh, story, of course, Matt, out of the United States. These ongoing protests, eight days uh, of protests now, police responding aggressively, some solidarity protests across Europe, too. And yet the markets are focused on economic recovery uh, and the uh, easing of lockdown measures. Italy, for example, today reopening yet further. US stock 600 up by 1.2 percent this morning. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be having much effect on um, the markets. It looks like investors view this as a, at least a short-term phenomenon in the U.S. We haven't seen 
massive effects from previous uh, big riots on the on the economic uh, situation across the U.S., especially after such a huge dip, from which you'd expect even just naturally um, a pretty significant bounce. If you look at, for example, the S&P 500 index yesterday, it climbed up to um, 3080, so still above 3,000, still up at the uh, levels that we saw at the beginning of March. And here in Europe, man, the gains have been unreal. I mean, yesterday the DAX was up 434 points at the close. Today it's up another 204 points. So it's just been an incredible rally on optimism that we're going to see that stimulus package pass here in Berlin. Yes, indeed. Uh, And also um, a lot of markets betting on the ECB uh, also adding to its PEP program. Speaking of which, the bond markets right now, check their negative 38 basis points for German yield, so up three basis points. Yields rising across Europe, Italian BTPs at 152, US yields at 70 basis points, also up by one and a half basis points. Um, And as you mentioned, um, the European equity markets, in terms of the best performing groups, because they're all in the green right now, insurance uh, is the biggest outperformer up by more than 3%. Uh, and interesting movements also in the currency markets because the dollar continues to weaken three tenths of 1%. The pound is doing very well. This, I suspect, because there's some thought that this will be a crunch week for Brexit and perhaps there'll be a breakthrough. Depends who you uh, talk to, though. But the pound is stronger three tenths of 1%. The euro up four tenths of 1% at 112.13. And also stronger crude prices. Brent crude at $40.27, so also up by 1.7%, Matt. Those are the markets. All right. So let's um, right now uh, um, touch Talk base prices. on what's going on in the U.S., right? Uh, we'll we'll um, see exactly what's, what's going on in terms of... Uh, the protests, shall we, Caroline? Yeah, indeed. So, Bluebeck's Kathleen Hunter standing by for us in North Carolina. We've been uh, covering this live for you throughout the morning, speaking to our reporters in Washington, D.C., in New York, in San Francisco. But Kathleen Hunter is with us uh, in North Carolina. So, give us, Kathleen, your take on the reaction to President Donald Trump's stance regarding the protests. Good morning. Good morning. And I think that, you know, uh, really what we've seen over the last 24 hours is a pretty widespread, um, you know, criticism in many different circles, everyone from religious leaders um, to Trump's fellow Republicans uh, who have really had, uh, you know, I would say primarily a negative response to what the president had to say in the Rose Garden on Monday. And so I think that that there are some signs that that has given the White House some pause in terms of taking the more, dram- more dramatic steps that the president uh, intimated in the in the Rose Garden during his speech Monday night. Um, I think that, you know, certainly there were some positive reactions for the president from more evangelical religious leaders. But I think overall it's been um, pretty negative, I would say. What has been the response of Biden? I mean, to be honest today is the first time i've really heard of any real response and i know that trump um had tweeted something about biden being you know not not having been involved for um the past few weeks what's the story there well i think that you know this is all happening against the backdrop of biden having been uh trying to draw a contrast with trump in terms of being uh, really strong on the idea of socially distancing and not doing in-person campaign events. We already saw prior to this unrest taking hold, Biden talking about getting back out on the campaign trail more. And so in concert with that, I think what we're seeing is Biden, you know, yesterday going to Philadelphia, making a speech and really trying to draw a contrast with the president over, you know, his uh, approach to dealing with the unrest, talking about the need for change, uh, to structural racism in the U.S., the need for unity right now, trying to quell um, any sense of violence that's out there. Um, mm-hmm. I think that Trump and his supporters would really characterize that as much more of a weak response than what the president put at the, out there. But I think it does uh, draw a dramatic contrast for voters over how each of these candidates would potentially address this kind of situation. 
Yeah, indeed. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. That's Bloomberg's Kathleen Hunter there, live from uh, North Carolina, bringing us up to speed uh, with the US protests. Matt, um, even as curfews have been extended in some of the big cities, so there is a question mark really about where the US goes uh, from here. Do those protests actually continue or um, fizzle out at some point? Yeah, I mean, if my life as a um, US high school student um, gave me any... any uh, any insight into this, curfews are to be ignored strictly um, for Americans. Uh, I, I want to get over to Simon French right now. He's a chief economist at Panmir Gordon. And Simon, I've been looking at the past, um, in the, the past reasons that the U.S. has called in the National Guard for things. Um, we really, since the 60s, haven't seen this happen. I mean, George Bush called in the National Guard for the L.A. riots, but it's a first to use the National Guard at least this century, and yet the markets don't seem to um, be reacting. Yeah, Matt, it's very difficult to price this uh, this event because, uh, as we discussed about an hour ago on Bluebird TV, it's uh, it's one of those events where you know, there is so much um, there are so many potential angles in which this can take. Yes, there's the near term economic disruption, and that being um, you know disrupted to corporate earnings, but how do you put that additive on the flux that has already been generated by the lockdown uh, and disruption from COVID-19? And therefore, investors have probably put this in the, the bucket of, well, we're seeing this extraordinary stimulus from fiscal and monetary authorities. This is another disruption to the U.S. economy. We don't know which direction it'll travel, so we're sticking to our priors that assets are still being bought up at an ex historically exceptional pace by the Federal Reserve. Hmm. Uh, when it comes to the recovery story, which is what the markets are most focused on, um, does Europe continue simply to be the laggard versus the US and sort of stuck in between also the rising tensions between the US and China? So uh, I think in terms of the structural growth story um, that has split you know, investor views on the United States and the Eurozone over the last decade, that COVID-19 will change many things, but it won't change that. The structural growth rate in the U.S., we think, is about twice the level that of the Eurozone. And while there is huge near-term economic disruption, your positioning for higher growth in the U.S. is still largely unfettered by this. But then there's the second part of your question, which is you know, the, the, the timeliness of recovery. Now, on, on one metric, the less acute spike in unemployment that we've seen in the Eurozone compared to the US should mean that the trough is less severe. But actually, the adjustment to new patterns of demand will be harder in Europe. And therefore, what you get in the near term in terms of better output, you may squander and are likely to squander in the long term as it takes longer for your economy to adjust to new, new stages of demand. Um, I, I wonder what you think about the the recovery, considering what we've seen in China, you know, we just got um, yesterday some indicators, alternative indicators showing that business activity has recovered to about 85 percent of what it was pre, you know, COVID-19 crisis. Do you expect to see that in in Europe as well in the second half? Uh, yes, and I, I actually think it's it's right that you highlight that data because there's so much noise uh, out there in, in, in the market and the PMIs are exceptionally unhelpful at the moment. But the kind of metrics around getting back to 10 to 15, maybe 20 percentage points below pre-COVID level shows a couple of things. First of all, it shows that households and businesses can incrementally uh, adapt their activities and their behaviours to social distancing measures. And that over time, uh, that enables them to get closer to, but not up to, pre-COVID output levels, because you're still going to have a balance sheet overhang, a significant balance sheet overhang in both the corporate sector and the public sector. You're also going to have, you know, clearly businesses that just can't get through the footfall or the volumes under social distancing measures that they could have done pre those measures. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm sure we'll be discussing the fallout from COVID uh, for many more months. Thank you so much, Simon French, for joining us, Chief Economist at Panmure Gordon. Let's get over now to Bloomberg's Roger Hearing, who's got all the latest in world and national news. Hi again, Roger.
high, Caroline. Now, in the U.S., Democratic Party donors are pouring money into Joe Biden's election campaign as protests continue to gain momentum across the country. Two fundraisers say President Trump's response to the demonstrations and violence is motivating donors to give even more to support Biden. Biden's fundraising has trailed Trump, whose re-election effort has raised $742 million in the last 16 months. The killing in the U.S. of an unarmed black man by a white police officer is also sparking outrage across sub-Saharan Africa. From Cape Town, Bloomberg's Mike Cohen reports. Protests have been staged in Kenya and Nigeria, and several political leaders have voiced stinging criticism. They include Ghana's president, Nana Akufo-Addo, who says black people the world over are shocked and distraught about the killings. The objections are all the more stinging, given that many African nations have been at the receiving end of U.S. criticism for violating their own citizens' rights. In Cape Town, Mike Cohen, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Here in the UK, if you're of Bangladeshi origin, you're around twice as likely to die from coronavirus than if you're white. Bloomberg's Charles Capel has the details. That's according to a report released by Public Health England that found people from ethnic minority groups face a higher risk of dying from the disease. The report says a higher probability of living in large households, holding jobs that expose them to the virus, and living in densely populated areas increase the risk minority groups face. Being male, elderly, or living in poverty also makes a person more vulnerable. In London, Charles Capel, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. And after almost three months of restrictions, Italians are totally finally allowed today, I should say, finally allowed to travel freely around the country. Bloomberg's Flavia Rotondi has more. They will no longer need to submit a form in order to leave their region. They will be able to visit relatives and friends. Italy will also allow Europeans to enter the country, a move that will help the tourist sector, which accounts for about 13% of the Italian GDP. In Rome, Flavio Rotondi, Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Roger Hearing. This is Bloomberg. Caroline. Thank you so much, Roger. Well, let me tell you about what we're going to bring you this hour because we've also got another episode of Brussels edition coming your way. Today, a closer look at Italy's reopening. Maria Tadeo will join us in conversation with her guest, Wolfgango Piccolo, his Director General of Teneo uh, Intelligence, and also Brad. Fernando Benifei, who is the head of Partito Democratico at the European Parliament. So we have that edition of uh, Brussels edition next. You're listening to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. We're live from London and Berlin this morning. This is Bloomberg. Imagine. Imagine being denied an apartment because of your religion or your race or because you have children or a disability. It's so wrong. Yes, but who has the power to stop this? You do. Each of us has the power. The law is on your side. It's illegal for landlords to discriminate because of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or familial status. If you suspect that you have experienced housing discrimination, file a complaint with HUD immediately so we can investigate it. Fair housing is your right. Use it. To learn more, visit hud.gov slash fair housing. That's hud.gov slash fair housing. Or call 1-800-669-9777. 1-800-669-9777. A public service message from HUD in partnership with the National Fair Housing Alliance. Hi, I'm Bill Hageman, Witham's proud managing partner and CEO. We recognize this disruptive time is unsettling. For the past 45 years, Witham has been committed to helping our clients, our people, and our communities to be in a position of strength with innovative business advisory, tax, and assurance solutions. If you need guidance on business interruption and continuity issues or remote workplace solutions, please visit our website at Witham.com. Together, we can get through these challenging times. Ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived in Philadelphia. Local time is 3.05 p.m. and the temperature is 67 degrees. At this time, you are now free to use your cellular devices. You know that feeling when you get to turn your phone on after the plane lands? You can have that feeling every time you drive. Make sure your cell phone is stowed away whenever you are behind the wheel. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, and the Ad Council.
influential conversations from Bloomberg Television. Here's Yvonne Mann. Apple Golf, Kappa South Asia CEO and director joining us with the airline industry outlook. Despite the shock that we're seeing to, to the aviation sector there, that airlines are still reluctant to recapitalize their business. Why do you think that is? First of all, I think they don't know how. Because if you look at this post before COVID, they were already very vulnerable. Um, before entering COVID. This has been certain and an extreme shock. Now, we don't know. There are unknowns and uncertainty yet, but nobody knows how long will it last. So the amount of capitalization that most of these airlines require to reach pre-COVID levels is unknown right now. About $2.5 billion is possibly for uh, six to nine months, maybe at max for about uh, F- for FI-21. So I don't, I don't think they are aware how deep this is, what kind of recapitalization would be required to pre-COVID. Um, so I think there is a reluctance to, to fund, uh, and they were waiting for a government bailout, and that has not happened. Now we'll have to see, once this is clear, that the government is ensuring there's enough liquidity in the system. If you are eligible for funding uh, or raising debts, um, then you can. But I don't think they have any assets to monetize. Right now we are not seeing the promoters... Um, willing to uh, recapitalize the company. Hear more interviews like this one on Bloomberg Television, streaming live on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg mobile app, or check your local cable listings. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on QuickTake by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Good morning, I'm Caroline Hebke here in London with this Bloomberg Radio Business Flash. So European equities continue their rebound. We gain nine-tenths of one percent on the Eurostock 600 right now. In terms of uh, the top gaining groups, it's insurance and auto uh, car parts makers. Almost every group in the green at the moment. The Zetradax also up by one and a half percent. Cat Caron up by 1.4 uh, percent this morning. Uh, even though we had uh, those PMI figures uh, for Europe services sector in particular, yes, better than expected but still in massive contraction territory. As for the bond markets right now, um, big expectations that the ECB will uh, roll out more uh, stimulus. Uh, the emergency programme, of course, are less, less than a third of the money has been spent so far. Uh, negative 38 basis points for Germany yields, up three basis points. Italian BTPs at 1.53% and US 10-year yields at 70 basis points. It does look as if reopening hopes of more stimulus are really outweighing uh, any worries around U.S. protests and unrest or even the Brexit deadlock. Uh, As for U.S. futures uh, this morning, they've also been positive. U.S. stocks, remember, at three-month highs. Uh, The S&P 500 Emily futures up a quarter of 1% right now. And also in the oil markets, continued gains. Brent crude futures still above $40, about $40.16, $37.59 the barrel for WTI crude futures right now. That is a Bloomberg business flash. Uh, Now, let's uh, get over to Roger hearing who's got all the latest in global news. Good morning, Roger. Good morning, Caroline. Unrest has been continuing across the United States overnight. President Trump's come under harsh criticism for his response to the demonstrations. He's also not getting the backing of state governors over his offer to send in the military to prevent looting. Thousands ignored curfews last night as marches and arrests continued. The latest round of Brexit talks are set to end on Friday without a breakthrough. And Bloomberg's learned the EU is now pinning its hopes on a dramatic intervention by the Prime Minister. Boris Johnson set to speak to EU leaders Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel uh, later this month. He's likely to be told that the bloc can offer possible concessions if the UK does the same. And Sweden's top epidemiologist has admitted his strategy to fight COVID-19 resulted in too many deaths. And as Tegnell told Swedish radio that if he had the knowledge he has now, the response would have been somewhere between Sweden's approach and what the rest of the world did. Sweden's controversial approach has avoided lockdown, but resulted in one of the highest death rates globally. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Roger Hearing. This is Bloomberg. This is the Brussels edition. Bloomberg's briefing on what matters most in the European Union this week. Good morning. Welcome to the special episode of the Brussels edition. And this week we're looking at Italy. The country is reopening to international travel after three months of lockdown that brought 
the economy to a halt. The Italian government, of course, is hoping that lifting these final restrictions will save or will kickstart growth and tourism in the country. But the challenges facing Italy are many, with economists now predicting we could see a 10% economic contraction this year. Now I'm joined by Wolf Piccoli, who is president, co-president for Tenio, and he's joining me on the phone. Good morning. Good morning there. And Wolf, I just want to ask you, it's, it's, it's clear that the Italian government wants to get back up and running quickly, but based on the state of the economy so far, just how deep do you think this economic recession is going to be? I think the, the impact of the crisis will be a formidable one um, for, a, for a variety of reasons here. This has not materialized yet, also because shock absorbers are in place. For me, the real test will be once we get to around September, early October, uh, but certainly a contraction of around 13% is in the card. The first quarter, we've seen the figure, 5.3% contraction, uh, higher than expected. And meanwhile, the government still doesn't seem to have a plan on how to help the recovery of the economy. So you're looking at 13%, and uh, the government has put some measures out. You know, they've put those loan guarantees for companies are now saying if you come from abroad, you don't have to quarantine in Italy. Of course, that's designed to attract people. But overall, when you look at the package that's been put forward by the government, how efficient do you think it is? Um, it's not efficient. It was an old-fashioned kind of 1980s, 1990s package where there is a bit for everybody for all the key, the key components of the electorate. Um, it's not a package that looks forward, not a single talk about reforms. Um, so it's 80 billion between the two packages to put together. There is a good amount of necessary shock absorber, absolutely, but in terms of on the economic front, on the business front, uh, not much at all so far. And the September, as I said before, is a crunch time because at that point we will know how well we have done in terms of tourism, which is 13% of GDP. Um, and secondly, it's time to pay taxes. Lots of the taxes have been deferred. We have to be paid between September and October. So that is when, you know, the, some, when, when the risk of social unrest, for example, will actually increase. And like you mentioned, uh, when you look at the Italian government, they want to keep an eye on everyone. They want to have something for everyone. And the recovery fund will be compromised. Just do you see anything happening in the next two weeks? Do you think that Conte is actually in a position to be fiscally responsible, to convince the frugals to actually jump in and, and agree to something in just two weeks? Um, Italy is a spectator in this debate. Let's be very clear about that. The initiative is run by Paris and Berlin um, against the other side of the, let's call them the frugals here. So Italy is a spectator. Um, as, as long as in Rome they stop talking about cutting taxes, uh, thanks to the money coming from Brussels, that will, uh, that will potentially be helpful. But I think there is a more important point here. Um, in the best case scenario, this money will be available from the 1st of January next year onwards. Um, when we look at net grants for Italy, the net is around 20 billion euros, which is slightly above 1% of GDP. So politically, the wall initiative is extremely significantly significant. Economically, especially for a big country like Italy, is not that significant. So the question for me here, are we going to bridge between... Uh, the, between now and the end of the year, and the issue of the ESM is likely to come back on the agenda, and as of now, is politically very divisive. Because that, that was actually my next question, because the answer to how do you bridge now until the start of the next year could be through the ESM. The ESM is ready and available, but no one wants to go first. Do you see a case where that could change? Do you see a scenario where Italy says it makes sense to go in, let's tap it? Um, well, the reality here is that it was, if we look at the various schemes they put together, most of them, the money for most of them will finish around July. Um, so in my view, the, 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 the number, meanwhile now what the government is waiting for is to see development about the, the recovery fund here. So there is no need for an immediate move. Um, once we get to September, October, especially in a context where the tourism season maybe has not been great, Maybe we're going to have new clusters, 
of infections as well, which is a risk, especially the moment in which you open the border without a robust system of uh, tracing and testing in place, then the need for the ESM money will become um, more, 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 will crystallize, let's put it in that way. Um, the issue, I, I don't think, is a question of being the first. Cyprus already went for the ESM money at this point. Again, a small country, but still. Uh, I think the issue is political, it's about domestic politics in Italy, and it's mainly about the Five Star Movement, the senior partner in the coalition, because we know that the other coalition partners are keen on, the, on, the, on tapping the ESM. The, the Five Star is divided internally on the ESM, on, and almost, almost on everything else, and that's why um, the, the move is politically risky for Prime Minister Conte. And now that you mentioned infections, of course, you know, you're not a doctor. I'm not going to ask you to predict whether or not we're going to see a new round of coronavirus. But just from an economic perspective, can Italy withstand another lockdown? Um, I think it will be, um, it will be very difficult, um, not just for the, on the economic side, uh, but the most on the social, the social, uh, social side here. Um, I think it will really kill any kind of confidence left. It will be most likely the end of Prime Minister Conte's permanence in office, which is not necessarily a bad development in my view, but certainly political uncertainty will increase. So I, I... Picture this. Small businesses on eBay are working to... Get things moving. Sending spices to novice cooks. Airbags to kids. Desks for home offices. Delivering the goods. Shipping footballs. Fruit trees. And dishwashers. Thousands of small businesses on eBay are helping to keep the nation going. They are individually brilliant, stronger as one. Buy, sell, eBay. This is a message from the government about the emergency measures to support the economy during the period of disruption caused by the coronavirus. To help you, your business, and your workers affected, you can apply for cash grants, business rate holidays, statutory sick pay relief packages, as well as the coronavirus job retention and self-employment income support schemes. For information, go to gov.uk forward slash business dash support now. At Lloyds Bank, we know that money is a concern for a lot of people during this time. I'm really worried about the business, I'm worrying about you, and I, th I think that's changing me, and I'm worried that somewhere along the line you might not love me anymore. Oh, that's not true. Whatever's playing on your mind at the moment, Lloyds Bank, in partnership with Mental Health UK, can offer you support and advice. Visit lloydsbank.com slash mental health. Let's be honest, we all spend too much of our day on social media. But at least you can spend your endless scroll time to discover new things on TuneIn. Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to always be in the know about the best new stuff streaming in the app. From breaking news stories and live sporting events. Yeah, but it's unique times. I think there's, there's unique circumstances and uh, we're trying to... To stand out stations and podcasts. Stay in touch with TuneIn. Want to relive the glory of college football? Balls over a man into the end zone. The end zone. Come explore TuneIn's classic game replay collection to hear ESPN's complete coverage of the 2019 New Year's Six Bowl games. Don't miss your chance to re-experience the Rose Bowl, the 2020 National Championship featuring Clemson and LSU. There's going to be two champions on the field tomorrow night. There's going to be one team hold up the trophy. Ten, play to the five. Search Classic Game Replay so listen for free. ...of confidence in Italy's economy. No, I wouldn't do it like that. As a, as a market play, there is nothing here that reflects the fundamentals of the country, perhaps expectations that this is going to lead to some kind of new growth, a new strategy, because that is what Conte was almost hinting at yesterday, that it's not about taking the money and running. You need to use it effectively, but I guess you have no hopes of that. No, I don't. I don't think this government is in the position to put together a credible plan on how to use the potential money available from Brussels. Um, and the, 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 the record in office of this government is not a particularly good one. We know that Five Star, for example, is generally against major infrastructure projects. Uh, they are deeply divided about this. Um, infrastructure should be one of the key areas. Um, we haven't been doing infrastructure for a long time in Italy. 
and and still the the five star is opposing that. Um, so yeah, no, I'm, I'm not particularly confident about the ability of the government, even the moment in which the money is available, to be able to put together a credible plan and use this money in an efficient way. And. Now, just wrapping up, um, look, when you speak to investors, they always tell you, from Italy, I want to see two things, political stability and reforms. Conte says he has a mandate until 2023. Do you actually see this coalition lasting for three more years? Um, the advantage they have is actually their own weakness. I think the weakness of the coalition is the, the, most, uh, the, 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 the main strengthening factor. Um, here, because they fear the election so much that they will try to do everything possible, like we've seen so far, to try to avoid it. The other um, aspect that helps is the fact that the, the opposition also has not been able to put together a consistent line of attack here. So, would I put my money on this coalition lasting until 2023? Um, certainly not, especially because we don't know what's going to happen on the pandemic front, and we don't know how bad the economy is going to get. But certainly, if we look a shorter term, I don't think we're going to see elections certainly before the end of this year. And to 2021, maybe is a possibility. If that is the case, it would be the first out of the year. Uh, but it will depend very much on what we see between now and the end of the year, both on the pandemic front and on the economic front. Well, Wolf, thanks so much for your time. We always appreciate talking to you. And now uh, let's move into the politics. I'm joined by Brando Benifei, who is the head of the PD. That's one half of the Italian coalition at the European Parliament. And he is joining us on the phone from Brussels. Good morning. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi, good morning. So, look, coronavirus, this whole crisis has been three months. You're finally reopening to the world to some extent. But how much damage has been done to the Italian brand? Oh, well, I think that uh, for sure it's been a, a, a big hit uh, in the sense that uh, uh, Italy was hit hard in, in, in these months. Uh, and it will take time to recover also for people to uh, be uh, really uh, feeling safe in coming back. I think for the tourism, we will have uh, uh, problems. And uh, feeling safe in coming back, I think for the tourism, we will have uh, uh, problems. And I mean, there is some degree of irrationality in that, because if you look at the data, Italy is doing well at the moment. Uh, it's comparing also to other countries. But I, I think there is a psychological effect that is, is, is strong and it will affect negatively Italy at the moment. But you think that people will come back? Because this week the Italian foreign minister said that he is not going to tolerate the country's treated as almost a sick man of Europe. So clearly there's a worry here that the image of the brand, the, the image of the country has been badly hit perhaps in a way that other countries close to Italy have not. Yeah, but I, I think in this case there is some political expediency and some exploitation of the situation, to be very very honest. I mean, there are some countries that will want to, to now um, uh, get the uh, flux of tourism that uh, will not be uh, directed to, to, to Italy. They will try to to um, now to, to, to get that. And to be honest, I think that it's important that the European institutions continue to uh, work so that there is a rational uh, and uh, um, equal opening of, of the borders so that countries that have the same kind of uh, um, uh, pandemic situation, they, they will be able to open re reciprocally. Um, I, I think, it, again, there is... A, uh, some difficulty and some uh, uh, image uh, damage, as I, as I said, but uh, it will it will be clear uh, in the next weeks that Italy is perfectly fine again uh, to have people um, coming and to uh, and it's probably going to be safer now than other countries if you look at the data. And 
Speaking now of the politics and the economics, of course, you're based in, in Brussels, so you follow this closely. There's a huge meeting happening here on June 19th uh, in which countries like Italy will have to convince other countries like Austria, the Netherlands, and so on, that they have to somehow pay more into this budget to, among other things, help the South. Do you actually see a deal happening that day? Well, I think that luckily most uh, of the economic and uh, social uh, environment at European level is finally uh, understanding what we are talking about for real. It's not about the charity for the South. The problem today is to have a European common market that is not uh, destroyed and fragmented completely and to maintain um, the possibility of our chain of value between our uh, businesses to be maintained and to uh, so uh, restart the economy. It's not me, but the German Business Association that said clearly that without the northern Italy businesses uh, uh, regaining pace, uh, there will not be a restart uh, at full pace for the German economy too. So um, I think that it's, uh, it's I'm quite optimistic that with the necessary adjustments, we will be able to deliver um, the necessary um, uh, investment and, and the recovery plan in the next uh, months um, to also give a message to the world that the European Union is a community that is uh, united and is uh, able to take its place in a more and more complicated world, especially after this pandemic. And where do you think this tension comes from? I'm always curious. This lack of trust between the North and the South, is this cultural, is this stereotype, or you also perhaps accept that at times Italy hasn't really done the reforms that it needed, that it has been slowed on that, and that has eroded the relationship? Well, I think there is a, a, an issue of a lack of trust that has not been tackled effectively by the leading classes. I mean, um, today we don't really have uh, a, pub, a European public service or um, a, uh, a, a real cultural exchange at the level that would be needed by being united like we are as European Union. I want to point out that it's easier for uh, an Italian, for example, to know the best uh, and the most famous writers in the U.S., than those of Slovenia that is uh, bordering with, uh, with my, my country. And uh, this is a cultural issue that I, I think should be bridged. We started bridging it with uh, um, the exchange programs, with the cultural exchanges, with the youth uh, programs, but uh, that, that's a big, a big um, uh, still a big hole in the, in the um, building of the European Union. But also, there is a reciprocal misunderstanding. The Italians point out uh, to the fact that, for example, in Netherlands, you have um, a, a taxation regime that is considered to uh, be a, a form of tax uh, um, avoidance that uh, uh, attracts businesses uh, to pay less taxes. But Italy, at the same time, has a high um, tax evasion rate. And so... For example, on these fiscal issues, we should be able to find uh, a common ground. We need to do that. That We all do our part to have a monetary union, if I look at the Eurozone, where the fiscal aspect is not totally uncoordinated. In my opinion, this of the fiscal union is the core political problem of the frailty today of the union and its uh, incapacity of finding agreement uh, in due time. Uh, I hope that with our new plans, we will be able now to build an, a, a stronger fiscal capacity by the union by itself and not depending only on negotiations by the member states. Well, Brando, thank you so much for speaking to us. That was uh, Brando Benifei, who is the head of the PD, one side of the Italian coalition at the European Parliament. There's a lot happening, a lot going on, and you know, good luck to the Italy on a day like today. Caroline, Matt. 
Thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo there with our special edition of Brussels edition this morning. Uh, really good to get that perspective on Italy, as you say, uh, because so many of the restrictions in Italy are being lifted today. Uh, so uh, coming up next, of course, we're going to we'll be able to go there. Markets. Yes, exactly. Might... Perhaps holidays beckon. You know what? I'm going to call HR and ask for a week off because <laughs> there, I honestly, uh, there's nothing I love more than getting on my motorcycle and driving down to Bologna. It's just such a pleasant trip, and I'm so glad I can repeat it again. Also looking forward to talking to Stephen King, Senior Economist at HSBC. Next, this is Bloomberg. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Debbie Hart is president of BioNJ, which represents the interests of more than 400 New Jersey-based biotech companies. She's also a strong voice in the biotech sector, supporting research universities like New Jersey Institute of Technology. She sees NJIT as a valuable partner in attracting venture capital and biotech startups to the Garden State. So the number one reason that companies come here to New Jersey for the biotech industry is for our talent. We estimate that there were about 30 biotech companies in the early 90s in New Jersey, about 80 in 1998. Today, there are more than 400. And that growth continues and has come from every possible angle. Other countries, other states, they've spun out of our academic institutions as well as our biotech and our pharma companies. And we expect that growth to continue long into the future. And NJIT is a pipeline for talent, for companies, for entrepreneurs to do that important work. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.edu. Where will 2020 take you? Somewhere where people care about each other, about our planet, about creating a better world for everyone and becoming the best versions of yourselves. Join a community of like-minded individuals at the University of Winchester. Make sure to accept your offer by the UCAS deadline and visit our website to find out more. See the bigger picture. Be the difference. Go to winchester.ac.uk. This is a message from the government about the next stage of controlling coronavirus with NHS Test and Trace. To protect your friends and family, testing and tracing must become a new way of life. If you have symptoms, you need to get a test immediately. Don't leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, we will contact you to trace people who you might have infected. From now on, if you're told you've been exposed to an infected person, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Play your part and do the right thing so we can safely return to a more normal life. Go to nhs.uk or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. Ready for some straight talk on what's happening in the MLB? On the Barstool Sports Podcast starting nine, Dallas Braden and Jared Carabas cut through the BS to break down the league the way they really see it. Yeah, we're uh, we're continuing our uh, little mini series of college baseball coaches in addition to bringing you major league players from throughout the league. If you've been listening to Starting Nine for some time now, you know that we've had a big leaguer on every single episode for probably two years now. Search Starting Nine on TuneIn to listen. And if we get set, all right, Jerry and Jerry. Buckle up, race fans. NASCAR is back in the driver's seat. And you can cut straight to the action here. With the Performance Racing Network on TuneIn, you can hear PRN's live coverage of some of this year's top events. As NASCAR's top drivers, Kevin Harvick, Clint Boyer, and more get back on the track. Search Performance Racing Network to listen and see upcoming races. 
In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Let's be honest, we all spend too much of our day on social media. But at least you can spend your endless scroll time to discover new things on TuneIn. Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to always be in the know about the best new stuff streaming in the app. From breaking news stories and live sporting events. Yeah, it's unique times, I think, there's unique circumstances. And, uh, we're trying to-, to stand out stations and podcasts, stay in touch with TuneIn. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. Ready for a -a one-of-a-kind look at the NFL? On the PFF NFL Podcast, Steve Palazzolo and Sam Munson interpret the unique stats of pro football focus to analyze the league Cover secret superstars and discuss which teams to watch out for in the next Super Bowl. Let's talk some football. Let's do it, Steve. All sorts of stuff. We're going to do most improved defenses around the NFL. Solomon Wilcox, our very own. He went. He went into some detail over at PFF.com. Most improved defenses around. The Search NFL. PFF NFL on TuneIn to listen. Brian Windhorst and the Hoop Collective Podcast. What about Yas Tenakumpo? He is going to be eligible to sign a Supermax extension, which we were projecting to be worth $240 million this summer. Well, if the salary cap drops, and even if he's wonderfully happy in Milwaukee, it may make no sense for him to sign when he can just wait a year and wait for the revenues to recover and then lock in. Subscribe to Brian Windhorst and the Hoop Collective. Search the Hoop Collective to listen. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on QuickTake by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, good morning. I'm Caroline Hepke here in London with this Bloomberg Radio Business Flash. So right now, uh, the positivity in equity markets that we've seen in recent days uh, simply continues. Uh, the US stock 600 gains 1.1%. The Zetradax also up by 1.8%. The Cat Current gains 1.7%. Uh, this really is optimism about uh, more stimulus in Germany and the ECB reopening across Europe and the US seems to be outweighing uh, the protests and unrest that we've seen in America and also the deadlock perhaps that uh, we see during the Brexit negotiations this week. In terms of which groups are performing best in Europe uh, that uh, is currently down to uh, the insurance uh, uh, companies so up by 3.6% right now. In the bond markets also again ahead of this uh, anticipation of the ECB and how much they will add to their PEP program. Uh, European yields right now rising 1.52% on the Italian BTPs for the 10 year negative 38 basis points for German but yields and 70 basis points uh, for US 10-year yields. In the markets, it's interesting to note that um, in the currency markets, the pound is stronger three-tenths of 1%. So there is some optimism perhaps uh, in the FX space that there'll actually be a Brexit, a Brexit breakthrough uh, during these negotiations. So we're up three-tenths of 1%. So the pound moves above its 100-day moving average. The Bloomberg dollar spot index weaker a quarter of 1%. And uh, crude oil... Actually, Brent crude slips below that 40 handle, $39.89 at the moment. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Now here is Bloomberg's Roger Hearing with all the latest in world and national news. Good morning. Good morning, Carolina. Unrest has been continuing across the United States overnight, and President Trump's come under harsh criticism for his response to the demonstrations. He's also not getting the backing of state governors over his offer to send in the military to prevent looting. Thousands ignored the curfews last night as marches and arrests continued. The latest round of Brexit talks are set to end on Friday without a breakthrough, and Bloomberg's learned the EU is now pinning its hopes on a dramatic intervention by the Prime Minister. Boris Johnson set to speak to EU leaders Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel later this month. He's likely to be told that the EU can offer possible concessions if the UK does the same. And Sweden's top epidemiologist has admitted his strategy to fight COVID-19 resulted in too many deaths. And as Teglil told Swedish Radio that if he had the knowledge he has now, the response would have been somewhere between Sweden's approach and what the rest of the world did. Sweden's controversial approach has avoided lockdown, but resulted in one of the highest death rates globally.
Global News 24 hours a day on air and on quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Roger Hearing. This is Bloomberg. Matt. Roger, thanks very much for that. Now, let's get over to Nathan Hager. He's in the U.S. preparing for his program, Daybreak America, coming up next with Karen Moscow. Nathan, um, well, let me ask first yeah. if you are uh, staying safe. I mean, it, it seems oh, especially concerning where, where you're located. Yeah, well, in Washington, D.C., yeah, there's been certainly a very uh, tough response uh, from the White House uh, to the uh, demonstrations on the streets. I personally uh, live way out in the exurbs, so I'm good. But uh, as for the tensions in the country, this has been a, a very tough week or so since the killing of George Floyd and the, uh, and the, the real crackdown on the uh, demonstrations and the violence that has broken out uh, in reaction to it. Uh, last night, not quite as tense as the last few nights prior had been, but we do have uh, Bloomberg Radio team coverage of all the demonstrations from coast to coast. And we have Ronald Temple. Lazard Asset Management on us uh, with us this morning to talk about how well the market has been holding up through all this, despite the uncertainty of the protests and you know the reopening uh, during the coronavirus. We are still under a pandemic, after all. We also have Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy with us. He's going to talk about the backlash that the president is facing over his tough approach, particularly uh, the one uh, outside the church with that photo op this week. And are the crowds raising the risk of a second wave of infection? Andy Pekosh of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health is with us to answer that question this morning. So uh, join me and Karen Moscow for a, 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 a packed program on Bloomberg Daybreak Americas. Matt. Absolutely looking forward to it. Nathan Hager coming up next with Karen Moscow. If you're listening on Sirius XM Channel 119, if you're in London... Tuned in on DAB Digital Radio, you will hear Bloomberg surveillance and a very likely our next guest. Yeah, indeed. Stephen King, Senior Economic Advisor at HSBC, because as Nathan was mentioning, yes, the markets are um, holding up pretty well, given uh, the mounting risks uh, around the world. The PMI data actually out this morning across Europe also has bolstered investors' sentiment that the economic recovery from coronavirus is taking hold. Yes, the numbers were dismal, but at least they were better going upwards. Growth of markets uh, are largely being spurred by fiscal monetary support according to our next guest but that will result in spiraling government debt Stephen King very good morning to you um, there's already debate about how quickly corporate taxes will go up is that what is coming next once we actually get over the pandemic I do think it's going to happen immediately. I think what the government are doing at the moment is absolutely the right thing if they did not do this um, then we'd have even more bankruptcy and even more in the way of mass unemployment, um, and that will mean permanently lower government revenues and much higher levels of debt. So what they're doing is right. However, um, if there's any kind of longer-term scarring so that uh, economies are permanently weaker than would otherwise be the case, then the debt numbers themselves begin to look a little more worrisome. They start to rise uh, pretty swiftly over the medium term. Moreover, um, there would be very little uh, insurance available in the event that there was another recession, say, four or five years down the road. So what we have is a situation whereby debt levels are rising at the kind of pace that you know, could, normally you'd expect to see only during wartime. And you could probably argue that this is a, a bit of a war in the sense that it's a war against the virus rather than an enemy belligerent. But nevertheless... Is the kind of thing which adds to debt, and I think eventually there will have to be a debate about precisely who pays for this and when. You know, I talked to the CFO of the ESM today, Stephen, and he said, although it would save them hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, well, or euros, I guess in this case, none of the uh, EU countries that need it have tapped the ESM for anything. They prefer to go to markets and pay more. Why? Yeah, well, I think part of the reason for that is that there's always a sense that if you ask for emergency bailouts and the markets themselves suspect that something very badly is going wrong. So, you know, it is. Avoid it, where possible. it is going wrong. Um, We've shut down the entire economy because of the coronavirus. I mean, well, no, it's, it's not so much that it's gone wrong. I mean, this is a, this is a, a deliberate policy decision. Um, and uh, 
the difference between this and a normal sort of recession is that normal recessions are associated with a collapse in confidence, with maybe a weak banking system, et cetera, et cetera. It's a deliberate act of policy, um, and the hope is that you preserve enough of the economic infrastructure uh, that things can rebound thereafter. And the important point about this is that the fiscal support we're seeing currently is not you know, the usual sort of multiplier policy, because there is no multiplier on the basis that everything is locked down. What you're trying to do is to pay a kind of insurance premium, an insurance payout, should I say, to preserve things in the hope that eventually things rebound. Hmm. Why um, are markets uh, not responding to the crisis? I mean, what else can you call it in the U.S. with protests there? I explain your thinking. What would it take, I suppose, for investors to to think about that as actually something connected to markets? Well, I, I think, first of all, what's happening in America is truly awful, obviously. Um, and um, sometimes what happens that's truly awful doesn't necessarily resonate with markets because markets are being influenced by something else. And at the moment, it's pretty clear to my mind that uh, markets are partly hopeful that the worst of COVID-19 is behind us. And that's just a guess at this stage. But also hugely buoyed by the monetary and fiscal stimulus that's been put in place. But bear in mind that this is um, something which benefits listed companies much more than it does, say, small and medium-sized enterprises who are not directly connected to financial markets. So in some sense, what we're witnessing is markets being buoyed by the idea that large companies will survive this in some shape or form, uh, but at the same time that many people will lose their jobs and many companies will go bust because they're small, that they're not directly connected to capital markets, and they're the ones that are suffering. Hey, just quickly want to ask about uh, no deal Brexit, Stephen. We've heard from a lot of people that because of the impact on growth of the coronavirus, um, a WTO deal wouldn't be as disastrous as it would have been before. I mean, it'll be, basically be absorbed in the drops we've seen already. Do you think that's true? Is it is it less likely to have a huge impact now if there's no deal? Well, I think the effect will be roughly the same as it would have been previously. The only issue is that you can't see it quite so easily because it's massively eclipsed by what's been happening with COVID-19. So, um, uh, yeah, the issue for the UK, in one sense, if there's a no-deal Brexit, is who do we do, who do, we do trade with? Um, I think there are hopes of you know, coming up with some kind of deal with the U.S., but the idea that we could do a trade deal with the U.S. and China simultaneously, that looks to be you know, a much smaller chance now than what was the case uh, maybe four or five years ago. So life is still going to be tough. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Thank you so much, Stephen King, for joining us this morning. Senior Economic Advisor at HSBC. Uh, yeah, an interesting point that you make, um, Matt, in asking Stephen about the Brexit uh, situation, because, of course, the UK, along with the US, amongst uh, the worst uh, countries to have performed when it comes to dealing with the pandemic. Yeah, although the markets are pretty psyched about um, every country, it seems almost around the world, the global equity rally just continues. Right now, we're looking at gains of more than 1%. In Italy, more than 2% in terms of equity indexes here in Europe. If you're prepping for the U.S. Open, we have gains on futures as well, four-tenths to six-tenths of 1%. This is Bloomberg. Did you know that with TuneIn's local radio feature, you can stream live FM and AM stations broadcasting in your area? Discover local news, talk, and music stations. Navigate to the local radio section under Browse to listen locally on TuneIn. You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. And as we get set, Archer up, race fans. NASCAR is back in the driver's seat. And you can cut straight to the action here. With the Performance Racing Network on TuneIn, you can hear PRN's live coverage of some of this year's top events. As NASCAR's top drivers, Kevin Harvick, Clint Boyer, and more get back on the track. Search Performance Racing Network to listen and see upcoming races. Let's be honest, we all spend too much of our day on social media. But at least you can spend your endless scroll time to discover new things on TuneIn. Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to always be in the know about the best new stuff streaming in the app. From breaking news stories and live sporting events. Yeah, but it's unique times, I think, there's through unique circumstances, and uh, we're trying to... To standout stations and podcasts. 
Stay in touch with TuneIn. Hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studios, this is Bloomberg Daybreak for Wednesday, June 3rd, 2020. Coming up this hour. An eighth day of protest across the country brings mostly peaceful rallies to the streets. Demonstrators and police clash in several cities but avoid major incidents or violence. And at the White House, the president finds his show of force facing a backlash on all fronts. Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio clash over the NYPD. Plus, controversial GOP Congressman Steve King loses his Iowa primary. I'm Michael Barr. More ahead. I'm John Stashauer in sports and NBA Hall of Famer has passed away and the NBA will vote tomorrow on a plan for playoffs that may not end until October. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak on Bloomberg 1130 New York, Bloomberg 991 Washington DC, Bloomberg 1061 Boston, Bloomberg 960 San Francisco, Sirius XM 119 and around the world on BloombergRadio.com and via the Bloomberg Business app. Good morning. I'm Karen Moscow. And I'm Nathan Hager. Bloomberg Daybreak brought to you by BNY Mellon's Pershing. Learn why the world's most sophisticated advisory firms and broker dealers rely on Pershing to help them improve profitability, create efficiency, attract talent, and manage risk at Pershing.com. And U.S. futures point to a fourth straight day of gains, 501 on Wall Street. And we check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. S&P futures up 13 points this morning. Dow futures up 159. NASDAQ futures up 32. The DAX in Germany is up 1.9 percent. Ten-year Treasury down 630 seconds, yield 0.70 percent. And the yield on the two-year, 0.16 percent. NYMEX crude oil is up 1.7 percent, up 62 cents at 37.43 a barrel. And COMEX gold is is down about seven tenths percent or eleven dollars eighty cents at seventeen twenty two thirty an ounce. And this data check brought to you by SEI. Today's competitive marketplace requires asset managers to become more operationally adept. See how you can transform your business with SEI's global platform at SEIC.com slash IMS. Nathan. Karen, last night saw marches and demonstrations from New York to Los Angeles. Protesters clashed with police in New York, Washington, and Brockton. But on the whole, it was more peaceful than tonight's past. We have Bloomberg Radio team coverage on the very latest, beginning with John Tucker in New York. Good morning, John. Nathan, the day began with mostly peaceful demonstrations downtown. Then, as the sun set and the curfew took effect, demonstrators in Brooklyn headed toward Manhattan. They were met by police that led to a tense standoff on the Manhattan Bridge where law enforcement blocked protesters from exiting in either direction. The situation was eventually diffused. Police allowed demonstrators to leave the bridge without incident. Mayor Bill de Blasio. This early curfew has made a big difference. Everywhere I'm going, streets are much more empty. Huge amount of NYPD presence. New York's 8 p.m. curfew will stay in place through Sunday. The city's public information office did report a looting incident in downtown Brooklyn. The department also said there was a shooting in Crown Heights, but it was unrelated to demonstrations. I'm John Tucker in New York. Now here's Martin DeCaro reporting from our Bloomberg 991 newsroom in Washington. Massive crowds descended on the block surrounding the White House. Many defied a 7 p.m. curfew as they returned to the scene of Monday's show of force by federal officers who cleared Lafayette Park to make way for the president's church photo op. But this morning, a new chain-link fence kept them outside the park. Some threw water bottles and shook the barrier. Someone let off a firework. Security personnel responded by firing a chemical spray and pepper bullets. The crowd dispersed. I'm Martin DeCaro in Washington. Now with the latest on protests in Massachusetts, here's Janet Wu from our Bloomberg 1061 Boston newsroom. Then I started peacefully, even silently. Thousands of people laying down in Franklin Park as a symbolic die-in to honor George Floyd. In Brockton, a tense night as protesters faced off with state and local police. Other large groups ended up in front of the State House, as well as outside Boston Police headquarters, held back by barricades. Several times over the evening, police officers at BPD headquarters took a knee at the request of protesters in an act of solidarity. Janet Wu, Bloomberg Daybreak. All right, Janet, thank you. Meantime, in California, crowds gathered in front of L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti's home ahead of a 6 p.m. curfew. The city was on edge all day as retailers cleaned up from the prior night's looting and vandalism. We get more from Bloomberg's Chris Palmieri in Los Angeles. 
it's been another day of protests, at least three or four very large ones marching in the streets, thousands of people. And unfortunately, what's been the pattern over the last four days is that these peaceful protests turn much worse as the nightfall comes. The night in L.A. ended with no major incidents. Nearly 3,000 demonstrators in Southern California have found themselves in handcuffs since Friday. More than 9,000 people across the country have been arrested in connection with the protests. Meantime, at the White House, President Trump is facing a backlash over his crackdown on demonstrations. The violent clearing of peaceful protests Monday for the president's photo op at St. John's Episcopal Church is being condemned by religious leaders, Democrats, and even some Republicans. We get more from Bloomberg's John Harvey in Washington. He's been criticized by church leaders, castigated by the leaders of both the Episcopal Church in Washington and the Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church. Separately, he's also come under criticism from an unusual source, Pat Robertson, the televangelist whose viewers are overwhelmingly Trump supporters. Even he thought that Trump overreacted and was all wrong in his response to the protest. And some Republicans have edged away from him as well. So it hasn't been a good 24 hours. The president finds himself with waning support in recent polls. A Monmouth University survey shows 74% of Americans think the country is on the wrong track. Up till now, the president had been pinning his re-election campaign on a strong economy. Lockdowns tied to the coronavirus have since cast doubt on that strength. And today we get a fresh reading on the fallout with ADP's release of its private payroll report. And here with more is Bloomberg's Vinnie Dow Judice. In April, the ADP report showed a record drop of 20.2 million jobs as the pandemic shut down America's economy. Bloomberg Economics says today's data will probably show job cuts extended beyond leisure, hospitality, and retailing. Friday, the government is expected to report unemployment top 19% in May. The situation could improve somewhat as the economy reopens, though unemployment is forecast to remain elevated for the rest of the year. Vinny Dell, Judice Bloomberg Daybreak. All right, Vinny, thank you. And futures are higher. S&P futures up 12 points. Dow futures up 151. NASDAQ futures up 29. The euro is at 1.1216 against the dollar. British pound 1.2586. And straight ahead, we have the latest world and national news. And this is Bloomberg. All right. Thanks, Karen. It's 5.07 on Wall Street, and Michael Barr has more on what's going on around the world. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Nathan. Mayor Bill de Blasio and Governor Andrew Cuomo are at odds over criticism against the NYPD's handling of recent looting in New York City. De Blasio rejected an offer from Cuomo to bring in the National Guard. Yesterday, Cuomo says the looting that took place Monday night was a disgrace, and he called out de Blasio and the NYPD. Do your job. Do what you've done in the past. You know how you stopped looting in the past? And how you stopped rioting in the past? Do that again. Whatever you're doing differently now, stop doing it. And do what you did was effective. I think it's deployment. I think it's the numbers. You have 38,000 police officers. Deploy them. De Blasio later said he is angry that Cuomo dishonored the men and women of the NYPD and he owes them an apology. The mayor, talking about the demonstrators, also says change can happen and it must happen. If the protesters say you're not hearing us, you need to see something more has to happen. We should respect that, learn from it, and act on it. The state of Minnesota has filed a civil rights charge against the Minneapolis Police Department in the wake of George Floyd's death. Democratic Governor Tim Walz. This effort is only one of many steps to come in our efforts to restore trust within those communities who have been unseen, unheard, and believe that those that are charged to serve and protect not only don't do that, they work against them. New York's MTA is seeking additional police officers for its subways and buses as the transit agency plans to increase service once the city begins to reopen next week from the coronavirus lockdown. In a letter sent to Mayor de Blasio, MTA wants a greater police presence to ensure people are wearing masks and practicing social distancing when possible. President Trump says he's looking for a new state to hold the Republican National Convention. President Trump says North Carolina's government 
governor refused to guarantee the convention could be held in Charlotte without COVID-19 restrictions. Longtime Representative Steve King has been ousted in Iowa's Republican primary after being ostracized by party leaders for comments about white nationalism. State Senator Randy Feenstra won the five-way race Tuesday. He faces Democrat J.D. Shulton, who barely lost to King in 2018. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Nathan. All right, Michael. Thank Thanks. It's 5.09 on Wall Street. Time for the Bloomberg Sports Update. Good morning, John Stashar. All right, good morning, Nathan. The NBA Board of Governors expected tomorrow to approve plans for the resumption of the season with games resumed July 31st. ESPN is reporting that with an additional playoff round, the date for a Game 7 of the NBA Finals would be October 12th. October is the time when teams are normally in training camp for the next season. The NBA expected to push back the start of the 2021 season to Christmas time. With all the games expected, Expected in Orlando, so much for home court advantage. There's talk of trying to reward teams with better regular season records in other ways, like an extra timeout or personal foul, getting the ball first in every quarter, or even teams getting their first choice on which hotel to stay at. Hall of Famer Wes Unseld has died at 74 in 1969. Unseld, an undersized center at only six foot seven, playing with the Baltimore Bullets, now the Washington Wizards was both Rookie of the Year and MVP. Will Chamberlain, the only other player to win both awards. Unseld played 13 years, a coach for seven more, all with the same organization. Ten NFL teams still have a training camp away from their normal facility. The Cowboys even go to California. The NFL says not this year. Every team needs to stay home. Jets and Giants already do. They also say no more joint practices with other teams. The NFL's chief medical officer says he's confident it will be safe to play football in the fall. Still no labor deal to make baseball return. The players don't want their pay cut, but they do like one aspect of the MLB proposal, playing games against teams close by and limiting travel. John Stashauer, Bloomberg Sports. Nathan. And John, today sports is back in New York. Belmont Racetrack is holding a 10-race card in Elmont. No fans allowed, but one race that may get some attention is the third. The morning line favorite there is a horse named Fauci. Thinking is that horse will socially distance himself from the field and win. Futures moving higher this morning. You're listening to Bloomberg Daybreak. What's the true value of your custodial relationship? Ben Harrison of BNY Mellon's Pershing explains. As sophisticated investors demand more from their advisors, advisory firms in turn need to rely on their custodian to help them grow their complex businesses. At BNY Mellon's Pershing, supporting the rapid growth of RIAs is our number one priority. We understand what it means to deliver true value to our clients who are looking for a custodian that is aligned with their best interest and delivers high value value solutions, all in an open architecture environment with flexibility, choice, and transparency. Learn why so many of the largest advisory firms turn to us for the financial strength, resiliency, and high-touch service that BNY Mellon Pershing provides. When you work with Pershing, we put your business first. Can your custodian say that? Learn more at Pershing.com or call 800-445-4467. Pershing Advisor Solutions, LLC. Member FINRA SIPC. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but you thought it'd be too hard or take too much time? Then go to Babbel.com, download the app, and try it for free. In just 15 minutes a day, you'll be on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. Babbel starts out teaching you words and phrases by matching them with pictures. You won't believe how easy the interactive program is. Soon the sentences get a little bigger, and before you know it, you're having simulated conversations voiced by native speakers. And because Babbel is crafted by language experts and uses the spaced repetition method, in just 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking the language of your choice with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just go to Babbel.com and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or go to Babbel.com and try it for free. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com. Hey, y'all. Where will 2020 take you? Somewhere where people care about each other, about our planet, about creating a better world for everyone and becoming the best versions of yourselves. Join a community of like-minded individuals at the University of Winchester. 
Make sure to accept your offer by the UCAS deadline and visit our website to find out more. See the bigger picture. Be the difference. Go to winchester.ac.uk. With the NHL season temporarily on ice, now is a good time to catch up on past games. With Game Replay on TuneIn, you can hear every matchup of the 2019-2020 season so far. And for a limited time, it's free for hockey fans everywhere. Search Classic Game Replays to start listening. You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. Okay, here we go. With the NFL draft in the books and the schedule set, check out a TuneIn podcast for daily updates. On the lead-up to the 2020 season, like the Ringer NFL Show, where a rotating cast of Ringer experts talk with players, coaches, and special guests about the NFL landscape. A lot of the other teams that we consider... Or ESPN's NFL Live. If there are some delays because of the COVID-19... Search sports on TuneIn to explore these pods and much more. This is Mike Golick from ESPN's Golick and Wingo. Every morning, Trey Wingo, my son, and I sit down to discuss all the news, drama, and highlights spinning the sports world that day. And with TuneIn, you can hear us whenever and wherever you go. Just search Golick and Wingo to start listening today. Buckle up, race fans. NASCAR is back in the driver's seat. And you can cut straight to the action here. With the Performance Racing Network on TuneIn, you can hear PRN's live coverage of some of this year's top events. As NASCAR's top drivers, Kevin Harvick, Clint Boyer, and more get back on the track. Search Performance Racing Network to listen and see upcoming races. Bloomberg Television. Here's Yvonne Mann. Apple Golf, Kappa South Asia CEO and director joining us with the airline industry outlook. Despite the shock that we're seeing to, to the aviation sector there, that airlines are still reluctant to recapitalize their business. Why do you think that is? First of all, I think they don't know how. Because if you look at this post before COVID, they were already very vulnerable um, before entering COVID. This has been certain and an extreme shock. Now, we don't know. There are unknowns and uncertainty. So nobody knows how long will it last. So the amount of capitalization that most of these airlines require to reach pre-COVID levels is unknown right now. About $2.5 billion is possibly for uh, six to nine months, maybe at max for about uh, F- for FI-21. So I don't, I don't think they're aware how deep this is, what kind of recapitalization would be required to pre-COVID. Um, so I think there is a reluctance to, to fund, uh, and they were waiting for a government bailout, and that has not happened. Now we'll have to see, once this is clear that the government is ensuring there's enough liquidity in the system, if you are eligible for funding uh, or raising debt, um, then you can. But I don't think they have any assets to monetize. Right now we are not seeing the promoters um, willing to uh, recapitalize the company. Hear more interviews like this one on Bloomberg Television, streaming live on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg mobile app, or check your local cable listings. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow. The global rally in stocks holding on to its momentum as investors show more optimism of quick economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. Treasuries are dipping with gold. The dollar gauge hitting its lowest level since early March. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. S&P futures up 13 points. Dow futures up 163. NASDAQ futures up 31. The DAX in Germany. 1.9 percent. Ten-year Treasury down 7.30 seconds, yield 0.70 percent. Yield on the two-year 0.16 percent. NYMEX crude oil up 1.9 percent or 71 cents at 37.53 a barrel. COMEX gold is down six tenths percent or 11 dollars at 7. 7- 23 an ounce. The euro 1.1217 against the dollar. The yen 108.80. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Now here's Michael Barr with more on what's going on around the world. Michael, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Demonstrators were out again in many cities across the nation. It was relatively peaceful. Bloomberg's John Tucker in New York has more in this live report. 
And Michael, an earlier curfew and more police added up to a mostly peaceful night in New York City. Demonstrators trying to cross the Manhattan Bridge from Brooklyn. They were turned back and dispersed. There was a report of looting in downtown Brooklyn, but nothing like Monday night. Members of George Floyd's family joined tens of thousands of protesting in Houston. Law enforcement deployed a pepper spray style chemical and pepper bullets against protesters at Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C., Protesters in Los Angeles called for the police chief job there. And at Brockton, Massachusetts, tense night as protesters faced off with state and local police. A Boston police headquarters, police officers there took a knee at the request of protesters in an act of solidarity. John Tucker, Bloomberg Daybreak. Thank you, John. President Trump said the Republican Party has been forced to seek a new city for its national convention planned for Charlotte, North Carolina in August because of coronavirus restrictions. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Nathan. All right, Michael, thanks. It's 519 on Wall Street. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studios, this is Bloomberg Daybreak, and Ronald Temple joins us now co-head of multi-asset and head of U.S. equity at Lazard Asset Management. Good to talk with you this morning, Ron. A better night uh, last, last night than the prior few in terms of the uh, tensions in the country, but this market has been holding up remarkably well despite all that's been going on outside Wall Street. What's your explanation for that? Well, I think, first of all, I mean, it, it is hard sometimes to reconcile the disconnect between what we see in markets and what we see in the world around us. And, and I think, you know, one thing is always important to explain to people is that, you know, financial assets are priced on the discounted value of future cash flows. So what this clearly tells you is the market is looking beyond the current social strife in the U.S. and assuming it's a near-term phenomenon. Uh, I personally do think it's actually a much more structural phenomenon that we actually have to address. But having said that, it seems investors are looking beyond that. But honestly, I would say investors also seem to be looking beyond U.S.-China tensions, which are escalating. Uh, they tend to be looking beyond the pandemic and extrapolating out with a very optimistic straight line um, some pretty positive news in relative terms over the last four to six weeks in terms of the reopening. So I do worry that there's increasingly a disconnect between the reality of the, say, six to 12 months ahead of us and what financial markets are pricing. You mentioned that structural phenomenon. Talk a little bit more about what you're looking at there. Well, I mean, I do think this is a situation in the U.S. where, you know, you've got you've got not only a, a pandemic that's basically been arguably disproportionately affected, uh, basically, communities of color. Um, you've also got an economy that actually has disproportionately affected those communities during the pandemic and for decades before that. And, you know, I think what you're seeing here is a culmination of a, a police injustice an economic injustice and arguably a pandemic injustice. And so I, I don't think this is just about the death of one man. I think there's a lot more here. And as a society, we have to come together and address this. I think arguably did we become a little too, um, too willing to think that we can only win if someone else loses. And I think we have to be much more focused on inclusive growth in this country and making sure all of our communities participate as the economy grows. And I think that arguably hasn't been the case for several decades. Yeah, in terms and, of where the market goes from here, what indicators are you looking at in terms of whether this uh, rally ha has sustainability? Well, it's really all, it's going to be all about the growth of the economy. And I mean, the reason I start with the economy, by the way, is earnings and GDP are two very different things. But it's hard to grow corporate earnings if your economy is not growing. And really the drivers, I think what's critical to watch here is this is not a financial crisis, it's a health care crisis. And so what I'm really focused on first and foremost is are we doing enough testing um, to identify people who are still asymptomatic or even have symptoms and make sure we quarantine those people so they can't spread the infection. Um, number two, are we basically developing therapies that can effectively treat this virus? And number three, what's the progress on vaccines? So if I think quickly on the testing, we've gotten to the point where we're up to about two and a half to three million tests per week in the United States. That's good progress and actually meets the kind of bottom line of the lowest range of the estimates of what we need. Uh, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, former FDA commissioner, has said three million per week. Um, Harvard has actually said as many as five million per day. So at least we're at the lower bound. On therapies, we made some progress with Gilead's remdesivir, uh, but it's not a cure. It reduces the death rate for people who are hospitalized from 11.9% to 7.1%, so it's a great reduction, but it's not the solution. You also have to be in the hospital for five days on an IV. And on vaccines, you know, the bull case seems to be we get a vaccine early next year. So I'm watching those dots line up. 
I'm also watching the economic data, though. And the economic data, I think investors need to be very careful. Over the next six months, I think it's easy to get whipsawed by data. Um, for example, this month we saw personal income go up 10.5%. Personal spending went down 13.6%. Savings rate went to 33 Well, that was partly because people got their stimulus checks in the mail. People on unemployment, in many cases, actually got an increase in income because the unemployment benefits were more generous than what they got paid at work. And people couldn't spend money because they couldn't leave their house. Now, that's going to lead to some pent-up demand over the next few months as lockdowns are rolled back. But what's really critical is to understand how sustainable that spending surge will be and what that will mean to company earnings. So, so I think it's going to be really tough to navigate the data over the next few months. And it's important that people try to, you know, not to get too excited positively or negatively when data swings one way or the other. Thanks for this, Ron. Good talking with you this morning. Ronald Temple is co-head of multi-asset and head of U.S. equity at Lazard Asset Management. Uh, stocks rallying around the world this morning. Another morning of strong gains for European equities and futures on Wall Street are following suit with S&P futures up 14 points right now. Dow futures, a gain of 176. NASDAQ futures are up by 32 points. The 10-year is down 7.30 seconds, yield 0.70%. Yield on a two-year Treasury note, 0.16%. You're listening to Bloomberg Daybreak. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. Stocks continue to rebound as focus remains on the easing of lockdowns despite the U.S. unrest and tense relations between Washington and Beijing. Stocks rose yesterday across the board on Wall Street, marking a third straight session of gains. The S&P 500 was up 25 points, or eight-tenths percent. The Dow jumped 268. The Nasdaq rose 56. The nation's biggest meat processor is returning to its pre-COVID-19 absentee policy, which includes punishing workers for missing work due to illness. Tyson confirmed the change in a statement to Bloomberg, but said workers with symptoms of the virus or those testing positive will continue to be asked to stay home and won't face a penalty while continuing to qualify for short-term disability pay. Unions warn that workers are still being put in harm's way as packers seek to boost output in the name of food security. Gina Cervetti, Bloomberg Radio. 25 years ago, NJIT graduate Dick Sweeney co-founded Keurig Green Mountain, a company whose incredible innovations changed the way the world brews a cup of coffee. Today, he lectures widely on business leadership and is a strong advocate for NJIT's work to combine business education with the power of STEM. NJIT is definitely fostering the innovative thinking for budding entrepreneurs simply because that's the world we live in. NJIT is producing students that have been trained, educated, and given the business acumen to be a contributor to a company. The distinct mission is to develop great STEM scholars. The attributes I've always looked for in team members are heart, smarts, guts, and luck. So we want people with passion, intelligence, courage, and never discount luck. The student coming out of NJIT has, uh, has experienced all of that. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.edu. Asset managers who see... Where will 2020 take you? Somewhere where people care about each other, about our planet, about creating a better world for everyone and becoming the best versions of yourselves. Join a community of like-minded individuals at the University of Winchester. Make sure to accept your offer by the UCAS deadline and visit our website to find out more. See the bigger picture. Be the difference. Go to winchester.ac.uk. This is an important update from the government about coronavirus. We all need to stay alert so we can control the virus and reduce the risk of infection. Staying alert means you must stay at home as much as possible. Work from home if you can. Limit contact with others. Keep your distance if you go out. And wash your hands regularly. Do not leave home if you or anyone in your household has symptoms. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. Want to bet football can make you feel nostalgic? Playing days are over, so... On the podcast, NFL Alumni Lounge, Charlie Booth sits down with retired NFL legends to talk about their careers, life after football, and everything in between. This is Darren Waller. Good to have you. Yes, sir. It's good to be here. Dana White, welcome to the Alumni Lounge. Thanks for having me, brother. Big member of our NFL alumni family, the CEO of the XFL, Mr. Oliver Luck. 
Charlie, good to see you. Thanks for having me. We're here with the president, Mr. Eric Price. Good to see you. Search NFL Alumni Lounge on TuneIn to listen. Are you fully informed on the NBA? On the NBA Hang Time podcast, veteran sports writers Seku Smith and John Schumann analyze the latest NBA news, storylines, and discussions with guests from around the basketball universe. Isaiah Thomas joined us here on the Hang Time podcast. Isaiah, uh, good morning. Everybody's doing well. As you know, my daughter tested positive. Search NBA Hang Time on TuneIn to listen. It's TuneIn Sports on this day. On this day in 1980, the New York Mets draft Daryl Strawberry at age 18. Here's Daryl warming up their third pitcher. Well hit to left center field. Out of here. Daryl Strawberry's first major league home run. Strawberry goes to the opposite power alley with great authority. It's a two-run home run. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130. To Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991. To Boston. Bloomberg 1061. To San Francisco. Bloomberg 960. To the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe. The Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. It's 530 on Wall Street. Good morning. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. We're just about four hours away from the opening of U.S. trading. Let's get you up to date in the news you need to know at this hour. Last night saw marches and demonstrations from New York to Los Angeles. Protesters clashed with police in some areas, but on the whole, it was more peaceful than in nights past. Bloomberg's John Tucker joins us live with the very latest. John, good morning. Good morning, Karen. In New York, there was a standoff on the Manhattan Bridge as law enforcement blocked protesters from entering Manhattan after the city's curfew took effect. That situation was eventually diffused. In Washington, law enforcement deployed a pepper spray style chemical and rubber bullets against protesters across from the White House. And in Brockton, Massachusetts, it was a tense night as protesters faced off with state and local police. We'll have more details on the events in your area coming up in just a minute. I'm John Tucker, Bloomberg Daybreak. All right, John, thank you. At the White House, President Trump is facing a backlash over his crackdown on demonstrations. The violent clearing of peaceful protest Mondays being condemned by religious leaders, Democrats, even some Republicans. We get more from Bloomberg's John Harney in Washington. That's come under sharp criticism from religious leaders, not just the Episcopal bishop who's responsible for that church, but also for the Catholic archbishop. Not only that, but Pat Robertson, the televangelist whose viewers are very much Trump supporters, was very critical of the president's response to the protest and his photo op in front of the church. The president finds himself with waning support in recent polls. A Monmouth University survey shows 74 percent of Americans think the country is on the wrong track. By most accounts, the economy had been on the right track before the coronavirus pandemic. Today, we get a fresh reading on the fallout with ADP's release of its private payroll report, and that's out at 8.15 a.m. Wall Street time. Well, meantime, U.S. futures are pointing to a fourth day of gains for stocks. Treasury yields are higher, the dollar weaker, oil is advancing, with Brent crude trading above $40 a barrel. Right now, NYMEX crude is trading at $37.44. Let's take a closer look at futures with S&P futures up about 17 points. Dow futures up 194. NASDAQ futures up 37. The DAX in Germany is up 2.3 percent. The CAC in Paris is up 2 percent. And the FTSE 100 up 1.4 percent. The Nikkei 225 in Japan jumped 1.3 percent. And the Hang Seng in Hong Kong up 1.4 percent. Ten-year Treasury down 7.30 seconds yield 0.70 percent. The yield on the two-year 0.16 percent. COMEX Gold is down six tenths percent or ten dollars seventy cents at seventeen twenty three thirty an ounce and straight ahead we have the latest world and national news and this is bloomberg okay karen thank you it's five thirty three on wall street let's get more on what happened last night in new york and the rest of the news from around the world here's michael bark Good morning michael Good morning, Nathan. An 8 p.m. curfew didn't stop thousands of defiant demonstrators from marching through the streets of New York City through the night. 
However, the destruction seen over the last few nights was quelled, and daytime protests, for the most part, were peaceful. Meanwhile, heated words are being exchanged between New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and Mayor Bill de Blasio. During Tuesday's briefing, Cuomo had harsh criticism for the way Monday's looting was handled by de Blasio and the NYPD. It is the largest police department in the United States of America. Use 38,000 people and protect property. Use the police, protect property and people. Look at the videos. It was a disgrace. De Blasio later said he is angry that Cuomo dishonored the men and women of the NYPD and he owes them an apology. When the highest ranking uniformed officer in the greatest police force in America can take a knee with protesters to say we can work this through together. That is the actual story. That is the lasting story. Not when a small group of criminals attacks their own neighborhood in the Bronx. Democratic donors are pouring money into Joe Biden's campaign in the wake of the protests spurred by the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis last week. Two fundraisers said President Trump's response to the protests and violence have motivated donors to give even more to support Biden. The former vice president speaking in Philadelphia yesterday took aim at the president. I won't traffic in fear and division. I won't fan the flames of hate. Longtime Republican Representative Steve King, who had been rebuked by party leaders over his inflammatory statements about race and immigration, was defeated in Iowa's primary last night. Randy Feenstra, a state senator, won the GOP nomination to run for the seat in November's election. J.D. Shulton, who barely lost to King in 2018, will once again be the Democratic candidate in November's election. In Missouri, Ferguson voters have elected Ella Jones as the city's first black mayor. Protests following the 2014 fatal police shooting of 18-year-old Michael Brown thrust Ferguson into the national spotlight over issues of race. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Nathan. All right, Michael, thanks. It's almost 5.36 on Wall Street. Time for the Bloomberg Sports Update with John Stashauer. Nathan, NBA Hall of Famer Wes Unseld has died at 74. He had had health problems for some time, recently pneumonia. Unseld was a player and then coach for 20 years, all with one. Washington, whose only championship came in 1978. Unseld was the finals MVP in 69. He was both rookie of the year and regular season MVP. The NBA votes tomorrow on the plan to resume the season in late July. ESPN reports the date for a Game 7 of the NBA Finals, not until October 12th. Criticism, nothing new for Knicks owner James Dolan, and he's hearing it now on why the Knicks never released a statement on the death of George Floyd and why there was an email sent to MSG employees saying they are in no position to know more than anyone else on social matters. DeAndre Miller knows a little about a 20-year-old Rangers rookie says he's always played on teams where he's the only African-American. He recently did a Zoom chat, and there were numerous racist comments with use of the N-word. Miller said he did not want to respond to that then, but he is now. Says it made him angry, frustrated, and targeted. An issue in the baseball labor dispute is just what are the finances of the teams. They don't open their books, but Cubs owner Tom Ricketts says most owners don't make money from their teams, don't have any reserves because they put everything back in expenses like player salaries. Ricketts says their financial losses this year could be, quote, biblical. June 3rd, the state of New York sports history, 1932. Yankees beat the Philadelphia A's 20-13. Lou Gehrig hit four home runs, the first home run game in baseball history. John Stashauer, Bloomberg Sports. Nathan? All right, John, thank you. It is 537 on Wall Street and time for the Tri-State Business Report. Here's Bloomberg's Ed Corey. Fashion brands including Versace, San Laurent, and Gucci have posted messages pledging solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. This comes after a number of luxury boutiques suffered looting in recent days in top locations like Soho. For Jersey City Mayor Steve Fulop, the pandemic's a good time to lure New Yorkers feeling anxious and cramped. He's reached a deal with developers for the first phase of Bayfront, an 8,000-unit project at the site of a former chemical plant on the Hackensack. Bayfront is the biggest project in Jersey City since the 1980s. A waterfront restaurant on New London's City Pier appears to be on the horizon, but it won't open this year. 
City Council approved an agreement with the owner of Sunset Ribs in Waterford, but it's too late in the year to start construction. At your Bloomberg Tri-State Business Report, I'm Ed Corey. All right, Ed, thank you. 538 on Wall Street. Bloomberg Radio is on the air from San Francisco to New York, London to Hong Kong. Let's check in with our global news team for some of the top stories heard on our 300 affiliate radio stations around the world. I'm Courtney Dunahoe on KTRH in Houston. Shale is coming back one well at a time with oil above $30. I'm Jeff Bellinger, and on WIOD in Miami, I'm reporting on a Morgan Stanley note that says the cruise industry likely faces a slow recovery. I'm Roger Hearing on Bloomberg DAB Digital Radio in London. We're reporting on the government pouring cold water on an EU appeal for compromise on post-Brexit trade talks. I'm Gina Cervetti, and for WBBM in Chicago... I'm reporting that U.S. farmers are awaiting a bumper corn crop. Now, if they could only see an uptick in ethanol demand. I'm Ed Corey on KFBK in Sacramento. I'm reporting Google faces a class action lawsuit in California. Those are some of the stories our 2,700 Bloomberg journalists and analysts are working on this morning around the world. It's 539 on Wall Street, and the latest edition of Bloomberg Business Week is online now with the cover on President Trump's political gamble to reopen the economy. Terminal customers can receive a complimentary subscription at MAG Go and listen to Business Week with Carol Masser and Jason Kelly right here on Bloomberg Radio or watch it on YouTube weekdays from 2 to 6 p.m. Wall Street time. Get global business, finance, and tech news on your TV, computer, or mobile device. Device. Just visit YouTube.com and search Bloomberg Global News. And now some other stories we're following. Zoom has transformed the hype into a huge jump in sales and customers. The virtual meeting software company says revenue soared in its most recent quarter. Zoom has now boosted its annual sales forecast. It has become an essential service, attracting more than 300 million participants some days. That's up from 10 million in December, a 30 times increase. Warner Music delayed the pricing of its IPO till today. Sources say the company wanted to avoid selling shares on a day the music industry had set aside to support protests against police brutality. The sale could value Warner Music at more than $13 billion. S&P futures are higher by 17 points. Dow futures up 200. NASDAQ futures higher by 43 points. You're listening to Bloomberg Daybreak. For the Jewish Communal Fund, Noel Spiegel, former senior partner with Deloitte & Touche and past JCF president, discusses the advantages of a donor-advised fund over a private foundation. There's a lot involved in having a private foundation. You need to engage attorneys, you need to engage accountants, file tax returns. At JCF, all of that is done for you. You don't have to get involved in anything other than making your contribution to your fund and then determining which grants that you want to make. A JCF fund may be opened with a minimum $5,000 contribution of cash or appreciated securities and can be used as an alternative to or together with a private foundation. If you have a foundation, you have to list all of the contributions that you made. Potentially, anybody, because the information is public, can find out exactly which organizations a foundation has made charitable contributions to. Let JCF simplify your philanthropy and protect your privacy. Learn more about JCF's private client group at jcfny.org. Imagine. Imagine being denied an apartment because of your religion, or your race, or because you have children, or a disability. It's so wrong. Yes, but who has the power to stop this? You do. Each of us has the power. The law is on your side. It's illegal for landlords to discriminate because of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or familial status. If you suspect that you have experienced housing discrimination, file a complaint with HUD immediately so we can investigate it. Fair housing is your right. Use it. To learn more, visit HUD.gov slash fair housing. That's HUD.gov slash fair housing. Or call 1-800-669-9777. 1-800-669-9777. A public service message from HUD in partnership with the National Fair Housing Alliance. This is your Bloomberg Real Estate Report. I'm Denise. Where will 2020 take you? Somewhere where people care. About each other. About our planet. About creating a better world for everyone and becoming the best versions of yourselves. Join a community of like-minded individuals at the University of Winchester. Make sure to accept your offer by the UCAS deadline and visit our website to find out more. 
See the bigger picture. Be the difference. Go to winchester.ac.uk. This is a message from the government about the next stage of controlling coronavirus with NHS Test and Trace. To protect your friends and family, testing and tracing must become a new way of life. If you have symptoms, you need to get a test immediately. Don't leave home for any other reason. If you test positive, we will contact you to trace people who you might have infected. From now on, if you're told you've been exposed to an infected person, you must self-isolate for 14 days. Play your part and do the right thing so we can safely return to a more normal life. Go to nhs.uk or call 119. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. Get your cook on with Asda. With Uncle Ben's rice, 250 grams for just one pound. And our butcher's selection chicken breast fillets, only £3.40 for 650 grams. Why not whack it in the wok? At Asda, we're committed to low prices every day on the quality products you need. Asda. Selected stores and lines subject to availability. Let's be honest, we all spend too much of our day on social media. But at least you can spend your endless scroll time to discover new things on TuneIn. Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to always be in the know about the best new stuff streaming in the app. From breaking news stories and live sporting events. He does! Fabry wins it! To standout stations and podcasts. Stay in touch with TuneIn. Who says you can't have a laugh while getting serious about America's pastime? On the daily podcast, Locked on MLB, comedian and baseball fanatic Paul Francis Sullivan talks about each team, each pennant race, and everything else in the game, from rule changes and controversies to baseball cards and stadium food. For those of you who are not familiar with me or the old show, I love to obsess over baseball. I'm talking baseball over the Super Bowl. We had a TV show in the Division Series during my wedding. Search Locked on MLB on TuneIn to listen today. On air and at TikTok on Twitter. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. This is Bloomberg Radio. Now, a global news update. Special report protests across America. An 8 p.m. curfew didn't stop thousands of defiant demonstrators from marching through the streets of New York City. Many did obey the curfew, but smaller groups intent on defying the order were met with a variety of responses from tolerance to dozens of arrests in Greenwich Village. There was some sporadic looting, but nothing close to what the city experienced on Monday night. Mayor Bill de Blasio was angered by the notion that people were looting with impunity. It is never, ever, ever accepted. It won't be accepted. In Brooklyn, residents of one neighborhood stood guard at a target to protect it against looters. Steve Kastenbaum, New York. President Trump appears to be backing off his threat to deploy troops to the states in order to quell protests over police brutality. White House officials say responses to demonstrations across the country indicate local governments are able to restore order. I'm John Trout. Why all the top-tier experts? Because business is not a magic trick. Give us a sense of the economic backdrop. Bloomberg Markets. Which financial records are these? Weekday mornings at 10 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio. Bloomberg, the world is listening. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow, and the global rally in stocks holding on to its momentum as investors show more optimism of quick economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. S&P futures up 16 points, Dow futures up 193, NASDAQ futures up 40, the DAX in Germany is up 2.2 percent. Ten-year treasury down 6.30 seconds, yield 0.70 percent, the yield on the two-year 0.16 percent. NYMEX crude oil up 1.5 percent. Or 56 cents at 37.37 a barrel. Comex Gold is down 6 cents per cent or $10.30 at 17.23.60 an ounce. The euro 1.1219 against the dollar, the yen 108.75. That's a Bloomberg business flash. Now here's Michael Barr with more on what's going on around the world. Michael. Karen, demonstrators were out again in many cities across the nation. It was relatively peaceful. Bloomberg's John Tucker in New York has more in this live report. And Michael, an earlier curfew and more police added up to a mostly peaceful night in New York City. Demonstrators trying to cross the Manhattan Bridge from Brooklyn were turned back and dispersed. There was a report of looting in downtown Brooklyn, but nothing like Monday night. 
Members of George Floyd's family joined tens of thousands of protesting in Houston. Law enforcement officers deployed a pepper spray style chemical and rubber bullets against protesters at Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C. Protesters in Los Angeles called for the police chief's job there. In Brockton, Massachusetts, a tense night as protesters faced off with state and local police. At Boston Police Headquarters, police officers took a knee at the request of protesters in an act of solidarity. John Tucker, Bloomberg Daybreak. Thank you, John. Voters in Ferguson, Missouri, made history with the election of their next mayor. City Councilwoman Ella Jones becomes the first woman, as well as the first African American, to become mayor of the St. Louis suburb. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Nathan. All right, Michael, thank you. It is 549 on Wall Street, live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studios. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. We want to take a deeper look at the political dimensions of all the forces uh, taking place in this country right now. Terry Haynes is with us this morning, the founder of Pangea Policy Advisors. Good, as always, to talk with you, Terry. Uh, You know, President Trump had been uh, facing a lot of backlash before for his response to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, uh, with this uh, harsh crackdown on the protest movement following uh, all these incidents of police brutality in recent days, he's facing a further backlash where do you see the president positioned right now at this moment good morning nathan and thanks for having me on uh positioned as to his uh re-election chances or for uh or the sort of short term uh where he is i mean from he was clearly i was on your television air on monday and said clearly i think where he's going to go is is uh, full law and order, and that certainly ha- uh, has come to pass, and I think will continue to come to pass. Uh, uh, the president is not one for drawing particularly subtle lines, and in this case, the, the, the clear line that they want to draw is, uh, as I think he put it, I am your law and order president, and uh, and that's where he wants to go. I mean, not just substantively, but also because he, he sees political appeal in it. Uh, and you know, frankly, I think he's not wrong in that as far as uh, the vast majority of the country goes. Is that kind of stance sustainable at a time when we're, you know, five months away from the election? It's a long time to go here. Can the president continue to hold this kind of hard line and uh, continue to maintain support? Uh, can he? Uh, I think he, I think they're certainly more than capable of that. And uh, will they? Sure. Uh, I think I think they've they, they've done a, a decent job, and I, I'm not here to be a Trump apologist or a cheerleader at all. I think they've done a decent job so far at keeping a foot in both camps. Not a great job, but a decent job. Uh, you know, to be the law and order president and at the same time support uh, nonviolent protesting. And I think they will continue to do that, firstly. Secondly, I think the, uh, the net net of the polls today is that uh, if there is a Biden lead, it is at uh, it, it is firstly a popular vote lead, and as uh, the political pundit Charlie Cook says, that and five dollars will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks uh, in the popular vote. Uh, but the popular vote, of course, means nothing. But in terms of positioning for the general election, the Biden lead at best is tiny and is a general election lead only. Uh, Trump continues to be very well positioned in not only in his base states, but also in swing states. So uh, this is going to continue to be very much of a race. And uh, I don't look for Trump to be backing off of the stance he's taken so far. Where do you see the battlegrounds uh, playing out? Uh, Where are the states that uh, could be most pivotal? Uh, as we get closer to November? Well, the battlegrounds are, are, the well-known battlegrounds are places like Wisconsin, Florida, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Arizona, uh, to give you six off the top of my head. Minnesota is generally considered to be in there, too, because uh, Clinton only won that state by one and a half percentage points in 2016. Um, All of them are in or close to margin of error today, and that's just on a registered voter polls, and registered voter polls don't mean anything, frankly. Uh, Those taking comfort from either state polls or national polls that have Biden in large leads uh, uh, need to, to take a breath because 
uh, registered. What what matters is likely voter polls, and we haven't seen very many of them yet. Uh, if Biden is barely leading in registered voter polls, uh, this race is an absolute dead heat in most of those battlegrounds, uh, which today is advantage Trump. And as you point out, it's five months away. It's a long way, but still, that's where it is. What about the factor of mail-in voting? Is that going to uh, alter the uh, the trajectory of this race? I think it. Uh, I think it probably does to some extent. Uh, people will make up their minds earlier. Uh, people will make up their minds differently. Uh, just earlier is different, I guess, and uh, than they otherwise might. Uh, it will also introduce a, a new element of chaos into the race, by the way, because uh, depending on how states decide to do their mail-in votes, and there's an awful lot of intangibles here, not least of which uh, the, the possibility, I, I doubt it's a probability today, but a possibility uh, that you, you have COVID restrictions still in place uh, that, uh, that, that end up extending uh uh, election deadlines uh, that the popular vote uh, and the electoral college aren't known for some days after the election. Uh, so uh, there's an awful lot of imponderables here, and you know, we we know already from early voting uh, the, the the some of the effects uh, on the presidential election. So what you have is is a world where that is a substantial uncertainty. Yes. All right. Terry Haynes, founder of Pangea Policy Advisors. Great to talk with you this morning. Thanks for being with us. Karen? All right, Nathan, thank you. It is 5.55 on Wall Street. It is time now for the Bloomberg Law Report. It is brought to you by American Arbitration Association International Trade or Business Dispute Resolve Faster with the International Center for Dispute Resolution, the leader in alternative dispute resolution around the world, ICDR.org. Let's get to the legal stories we're watching this morning from Bloomberg's Jeff Bellinger. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration says the number of meat plant inspections has increased by 70% since the end of April when President Trump ordered the plants to open. The Ninth Circuit ruled the Department of Justice was wrong to terminate the asylum status of an Armenian family before allowing the family a chance to respond. And the First Circuit ruled that Novo Nordisk cannot enforce a non-compete contract against a former employee who went to work for another pharmaceutical company after being laid off and rehired. Bloomberg Law. Everything you need, all on one legal research platform, including guidance, analysis, and Bloomberg Market Intelligence. Find out more at BloombergLaw.com. And another legal story, we're watching a unanimous Supreme Court decision upholding the oversight board responsible for resolving Puerto Rico's debt crisis. The justices rejected a bondholder challenge and bolstered the panel's efforts to pull the island out of bankruptcy. For more on the decision, Bloomberg's June Grasso speaks to the former governor of Puerto Rico, Luis Fortuno, a partner at Steptoe and Johnson. Do you agree with this decision by the court? I think this is the right decision, you know, from the purely legal point of view, I agree that their functions are mostly local. I would have loved for the courts to go into dicta and also rule about the extent of those congressional powers to dictate some of what occurs in territories that are pretty vast and open-ended as opposed to congressional powers over states and how far it can go. But, you know, the court did what they normally do which is they decide in a narrow way what they have before them. So in that sense, I don't think it's surprising. And this is what many of us expected would happen. The court agreed to review the appeals court decision on a relatively quick basis, but it took nearly eight months to issue its decision. Do you make anything out of that delay? And then this issuance of this narrow decision? It may have been that the justices preferred issuing a unanimous decision on this issue because of the sensitivities regarding tr the treatment of the territory of Puerto Rico by Congress. And I would not be surprised if they were just working at it to see if they could reach a unanimous decision. And as the former governor of Puerto Rico, Luis Fortuno, speaking of Bloomberg's June Grasso, catch more of that interview plus analysis of the latest legal news by listening to the Bloomberg Law Show at 10 p.m. Eastern time or downloading the show at Bloomberg.com slash podcast. And attorneys can find exceptional legal research and business development tools at BloombergLaw.com. And Bloomberg Daybreak continues. This is Bloomberg. 
influential conversations from Bl- We're all having to get used to the new normal and at Birkbeck University we're experts at being adaptable As London's Evening University we've been flexing around the lives of busy commuters for nearly 200 years and you can find everything you need to secure your place for autumn online from expert advice to virtual tours a live chat with our students and course applications Make the new normal studying for the career that you really want Search Birkbeck, and it's new problem solved. Picture this. Small businesses on eBay are working to... Get things moving. Sending spices to novice cooks. Airbags to kids. Desks for home offices. Delivering the goods. Shipping footballs. Fruit trees. And dishwashers. Thousands of small businesses on eBay are helping to keep the nation going. They are individually brilliant, stronger as one. Buy, sell, eBay. Get your cook on with Asta. With Uncle Ben's rice, 250 grams for just £1. And our butcher's select and chicken breast fillets, only £3.40 for 650 grams. Why not whack it in the wok? At Asta, we're committed to low prices every day on the quality products you need. Asta. Selected stores and lines subject to availability. Bloomberg.com on the Bloomberg Business app and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studios, this is Bloomberg Daybreak for Wednesday, June 3rd, 2020. Coming up this hour... An eighth day of protest across the country brings mostly peaceful rallies to the streets. Demonstrators and police clash in several cities but avoid major incidents or violence. And at the White House, the president finds his show of force facing a backlash on all fronts. Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio clash over the NYPD. Plus, controversial GOP Congressman Steve King loses his Iowa primary. I'm Michael Barr. More ahead. I'm John Stashauer in sports. An NBA Hall of Famer has passed away and the NBA will vote tomorrow on a plan for playoffs that may not end until October. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak on Bloomberg 1130 New York, Bloomberg 991 Washington DC, Bloomberg 1061 Boston, Bloomberg 960 San Francisco, Sirius XM 119 and around the world on BloombergRadio.com and via the Bloomberg Business app. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow, and U.S. futures are pointing to a fourth straight day of gains. We're coming up to 601 on Wall Street, and we check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. Right now, S&P futures are up 14 points. Dow futures up 177. NASDAQ futures up 36. The DAX in Germany is up 2.25%. The CAC in Paris up 1.9%. And the FTSE 100 is up 1.3%. Nikkei 225 in Japan was up 1.3%. And the Hang Seng in Hong Kong jumped 1.4%. Ten-year Treasury down 5.30 seconds. Yield 0.70%. The yield on the two-year 0.16%. NYMEX crude oil is up half percent or 20 cents at 37.05 a barrel. Comex gold is down half percent or nine dollars twenty cents at seventeen twenty five an ounce. The euro one point one two one three against the dollar and the yen one oh eight point seven nine. Nathan. Karen last night saw marches and demonstrations from New York to Los Angeles. Protesters clashed with police in New York, DC and Massachusetts, but on the whole it was more peaceful than in nights past. We have Bloomberg Radio team coverage on the very latest, beginning with John Tucker in New York. Good morning, John. Nathan, the day began with mostly peaceful demonstrations downtown. Then, as the sun set and the curfew took effect, demonstrators in Brooklyn headed toward Manhattan. They were met by police that led to a tense standoff on the Manhattan Bridge where law enforcement blocked protesters from exiting in either direction. The situation was eventually diffused. Police allowed demonstrators to leave the bridge without incident. Mayor Bill de Blasio. This early curfew has made a big difference. Everywhere I'm going, streets are much more empty. Huge amount of NYPD presence. New York's 8 p.m. curfew will stay in place through Sunday. The city's public information office did report a looting incident in downtown Brooklyn. The department also said there was a shooting in Crown Heights, but it was unrelated to demonstrations. I'm John Tucker in New York. Now here's Martin DeCaro reporting from our Bloomberg 991 newsroom in Washington. Massive crowds descended on the block surrounding the White House. Many defied a 7 p.m. curfew as they returned to the scene of Monday's show of force by federal officers who cleared Lafayette Park to make way for the president's church photo op. But this morning, a new chain-link fence kept them outside the park, 
Some threw water bottles and shook the barrier. Someone let off a firework. Security personnel responded by firing a chemical spray and pepper bullets. The crowd dispersed. I'm Martin DeCaro in Washington. Now with the latest on protests in Massachusetts, here's Janet Wu from our Bloomberg 1061 Boston newsroom. The night started peacefully, even silently. Thousands of people laying down in Franklin Park as a symbolic die-in to honor George Floyd. In Brockton, a tense night as protesters faced off with state and local police. Other large groups ended up in front of the state house, as well as outside Boston Police headquarters, held back by barricades. Several times over the evening, police officers at BPD headquarters took a knee at the request of protesters in an act of solidarity. Janet Wu, Bloomberg Daybreak. All right, Janet, thank you. Meantime, in California, crowds gathered in front of L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti's home ahead of a 6 p.m. curfew. The city was on edge all day as retailers cleaned up from the prior night's looting and vandalism. We get more from Bloomberg's Chris Palmieri in Los Angeles. It's been another day of protests, so we three or four very large ones marching in the streets, thousands of people. And unfortunately, what's been the pattern over the last four days is that these peaceful protests turn much worse as the nightfall comes. The night in L.A. ended with no major incidents. Nearly 3,000 demonstrators in Southern California have found themselves in handcuffs since Friday. More than 9,000 people across the country have been arrested in connection with the protests. Meantime, at the White House, President Trump is facing a backlash over his crackdown on demonstrations. The violent clearing of peaceful protests Monday for the president's photo op at St. John's Episcopal Church is being condemned by religious leaders, Democrats, and even some Republicans. We get more from Bloomberg's John Hardy in Washington. He's been criticized by church leaders, castigated by the leaders of both the Episcopal Church in Washington and the Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church. Separately, he's also come under criticism from an unusual source, Pat Robertson, the televangelist whose viewers are overwhelmingly Trump supporters. Even he thought that Trump overreacted and was all wrong in his response to the protest. And some Republicans have edged away from him as well. So it hasn't been a good 24 hours. The president finds himself with waning support in recent polls. A Monmouth University survey shows 74% of Americans think the country is on the wrong track. Up till now, the president had been pinning his re-election campaign on a strong economy. Lockdowns tied to the coronavirus have since cast doubt on that strength. And today we get a fresh reading on the fallout with ADP's release of its private payroll report. Here with more is Bloomberg's Vinnie Dal Judice. In April, the ADP report showed a record drop of 20.2 million jobs as the pandemic shut down America's economy. Bloomberg Economics says today's data will probably show job cuts extended beyond leisure hospitality and retailing. Friday, the government is expected to report unemployment top 19% in May. The situation could improve somewhat as the economy reopens, though unemployment is forecast to remain elevated for the rest of the year. Vinny Dell, Two Dice Bloomberg Daybreak. All right, Vinny, thank you. S&P futures are up 12 points this morning. Dow futures up 163 and NASDAQ futures up 29. 10-year Treasury down 432 seconds, yield 0.69 percent. The yield on the two-year 0.16 percent. NYMEX crude oil is lower now. It's down about six tenths percent or 21 cents at $36.58 a barrel. And COMEX gold is down half percent or $8.80 at $17.25, 20 an ounce. Straight ahead, we have the latest world and national news, and this is Bloomberg. All right, Karen, thank you to 607 on Wall Street. Now let's bring in Michael Barr for a check of what else is going on around the world. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Nathan. Mayor Bill de Blasio and Governor Andrew Cuomo are at odds over criticism against the NYPD's handling of recent looting in New York City. De Blasio rejected an offer from Cuomo to bring in the National Guard. Yesterday, Cuomo says the looting that took place Monday night was a disgrace, and he called out de Blasio and the NYPD. Do your job. Do what you've done in the past. You know how you stopped looting in the past? And how you stopped rioting in the past? Do that again. Whatever you're doing differently now, stop doing it. And do what you did was effective. I think it's deployment. I think it's the numbers. You have 38,000 police officers. Deploy them. De Blasio later said he is angry that Cuomo dishonored the men and women of the NYPD and he owes them an apology. The mayor, talking about the demonstrators, also says change can happen and it must happen. If the protesters say you're not hearing us, you need to see something more has to happen, we should respect that, learn from it, and act on it. 
The state of Minnesota has filed a civil rights charge against the Minneapolis Police Department in the wake of George Floyd's death. Democratic Governor Tim Walz. This effort is only one of many steps to come in our efforts to restore trust within those communities who have been unseen, unheard, and believe that those that are charged to serve and protect not only don't do that, they work against them. New York's MTA is seeking additional police officers for its subways and buses as the transit agency plans to increase service once the city begins to reopen next week from the coronavirus lockdown. In a letter sent to Mayor de Blasio, the MTA wants a greater police presence to ensure people are wearing masks and practicing social distancing when possible. The MTA is asking the city for a million masks and a thousand volunteers to help them provide face covers for those who don't have them. President Trump says he's looking for a new state to hold the Republican National Convention. President Trump says North Carolina's governor refused to guarantee the convention could be held in Charlotte without COVID-19 restrictions. Longtime Representative Steve King has been ousted in Iowa's Republican primary after being ostracized by party leaders for comments about white nationalism. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on quick take by Bloomberg powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts and more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Nathan. Thank you, Michael. It is 6.09 on Wall Street. Time for the Bloomberg Sports Update. Good morning, John Stashar. Good morning, Nathan. The NBA Board of Governors expected tomorrow to approve plans for the resumption of the season with games to resume July 31st. ESPN is reporting that with an additional playoff round, the date for a Game 7 of the NBA Finals would be October 12th. October is a time when teams are normally in training camp for the next season. NBA expected to push back the start of the 2021 season at Christmas time. With all the games expected in Orlando, so much for home court advantage, there's talk of trying to reward teams with better regular season records in other ways, like giving them an extra coach's challenge or a personal foul, getting the ball first in every quarter, or even those teams getting their first choice on which hotel to stay at. Hall of Famer Wes Unseld has died at 74. 1969, Unseld, an undersized center at only 6'7", playing for the Baltimore Bullets, who are now the Washington Wizards, won both the Rookie of the Year and MVP awards. Will Chamberlain, the only other player to do that. Unseld played 13 years, a coach for seven more years, all with the same organization. Ten NFL teams still have a training camp away from their normal facility. Cowboys even go to California. The NFL says not this year. Every team needs to stay home. Jets and Giants already do. They also say no more joint practices with other teams. NFL's chief medical officer says he's confident it will be safe to play football in the fall. Still no labor deal to make baseball return. The players don't want their pay cut, but they do like one aspect of the MLB proposal, playing games against teams close by and limiting travel. John Stash, yeah, we're Bloomberg Sports. Nathan? Okay, John, thank you. Today, sports is back in New York. Belmont Racetrack will hold a 10-card race in Elmont, though no fans will be allowed. One race that may get a little more attention than others is the third, the morning line favorite, is a horse named Fauci. Futures moving higher this morning. You are listening to Bloomberg Daybreak. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but you thought it'd be too hard or take too much time? Then go to Babbel.com, download the app, and try it for free. In just 15 minutes a day, you'll be on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. Babbel starts out teaching you words and phrases by matching them with pictures. You won't believe how easy the interactive program is. Soon the sentences get a little bigger, and before you know it, you're having simulated conversations voiced by native speakers. And because Babbel is crafted by language experts and uses the spaced repetition method, in just 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking the language of your choice with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just go to Babbel.com and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or go to Babbel.com and try it for free. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, makes innovation happen. The university helped biomedical engineering professor Tara Alvarez launch a startup that may revolutionize vision therapy. 
Our startup through NJIT is called Ocular Motor Technology. We create virtual reality vision therapy in a head-mounted display. So it's gaming and basically we're sugarcoating the therapy so that children and young adolescents don't even realize they're doing therapy. To accomplish this, we need biomedical engineers, which are here on NJIT campus, computer scientists, artists, people that are into story development. And then we are collaborating with a lot of the large pediatric medical centers. This idea of a startup culture is extremely important to not just NJIT and the National Science Foundation, but also to the U.S. as a societal whole. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.edu. This is an important update from the government about coronavirus symptoms and testing. If you have any one of the following symptoms, a high temperature, a new continuous cough, loss of taste or smell, you can now get tested. Do not leave home for any reason other than to get tested. Find out how to get a test and how long to isolate at nhs.uk slash coronavirus. Stay alert. Control the virus. Save lives. Ready for some straight talk on what's happening in the MLB? On the Barstool Sports Podcast starting nine, Dallas Braden and Jared Carabas cut through the BS to break down the league the way they really see it. Yeah, we're, uh, we're continuing our uh, little mini-series of college baseball coaches in addition to bringing you major league players from throughout the league. If you've been listening to Starring Nine for some time now, you know that we've had a big leaguer on every single episode for probably two years now. Search Starting Nine on TuneIn to listen. Let's be honest, we all spend too much of our day on social media. But at least you can spend your endless scroll time to discover new things on TuneIn. Follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to always be in the know about the best new stuff streaming in the app. From breaking news stories... And live sporting events. He does! Barry wins it! To stand out stations and podcasts. Stay in touch with TuneIn. Want to relive the glory of college football? Balls over a man into the end zone. The end zone. Come explore TuneIn's classic game replay collection to hear ESPN's complete coverage of the 2019 New Year's Six Bowl games. Don't miss your chance to re-experience the Rose Bowl, the 2020 National Championship featuring Clemson and LSU. There's going to be two champions on the field tomorrow night. There's going to be one team hold up the trophy. Ten, right to the Search Classic Game Replays to listen for free. Here's Sherry Ann. U.S. stocks rose for a third day on Tuesday amid positive economic signals as the virus lockdowns ease. This despite tensions and protests continuing across the country. Joining us now to discuss is Main State Capital Management founder, CEO, and Chief Investment Strategist, David Kudla. David, great to have you with us. We continue to hear about this disconnect between the real world and the markets. How long are we expected to continue seeing this? And what questions is this? give rise to when it comes to valuations yeah well it's interesting you know when we we turn on the tv or we we hear the news we on social media uh you know we would we see what's happening in the country here and it's you know uh a lot like what we've we've seen in in hong kong over the past year uh with you know the 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 riots that are that are going on in 140 cities across the u.s 4400 people arrested uh, we now have 29 states that have called in their National Guard. 40 cities have implemented curfews, and it's almost as if uh, it's almost ignored by the, the stock markets because it, it, the U.S. stock markets have continued to advance in spite of it. So, you know, when we talk about that disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street, uh, we're seeing it once again. Hear more interviews like this one on Bloomberg Television, streaming live on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg mobile app, or check your local cable listings. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow, and this update brought to you by IBKR, the professional's gateway to the world's markets. Their clients enjoy lowest cost access to stocks, options, futures, forex, and fixed income from a single integrated account. Learn more at IBKR.com. A meeting between OPEC and its allies this month was in doubt as Saudi Arabia and Russia drew a hard line over quota cheating by some nations. The two leaders of OPEC Plus told other members that talks planned for early June to discuss extending record output cuts may not happen 
If countries including Iraq and Nigeria don't make firm promises to implement their supply curbs, that according to people familiar with the matter, a NYMEX crude oil is lower, down half percent or 22 cents at $36.60 this morning. S&P futures are moving higher. They're up about 15 points. Dow futures up 184. NASDAQ futures up 33. The DAX in Germany is up 2.4 percent. And the 10-year Treasury down 432 seconds. The yield 0.70 percent. That's a Bloomberg business flash. Now here's Michael Barr with more on what's going on around the world. Michael. Karen, demonstrators were out again in many cities across the nation. It was relatively peaceful. Bloomberg's John Tucker in New York has more in this live report. And, Michael, an earlier curfew and more police added up to a mostly peaceful night in New York City. Demonstrators trying to cross the Manhattan Bridge from Brooklyn, they were turned back and dispersed. There was a report of looting in downtown Brooklyn, but nothing like Monday night. Members of George Floyd's family joined tens of thousands protesting in the city of Houston. Law enforcement deployed a pepper spray style chemical and rubber bullets against protesters at Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C., Protesters in Los Angeles called for the job of the police chief there in Brockton, Massachusetts. A tense night as protesters faced off with state and local police. At Boston Police Headquarters, police officers took a knee at the request of protesters in an act of solidarity. John Tucker, Bloomberg Daybreak. Thank you, John. President Trump said the Republican Party has been forced to seek a new city for its national convention planned for Charlotte, North Carolina in August because of coronavirus restrictions. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Nathan. Okay, Michael, thanks. It's just before 6.20 on Wall Street, live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studios. This is Bloomberg Daybreak, and with all the unrest across the country, it's taken some attention off the fact that we're still in the midst of a pandemic. But massive crowds on the streets are raising some concern in a few quarters that it could spark a second wave of coronavirus infection. Andy Pekosh joins us now, professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, good morning, professor. Is that a concern you share? Yeah, you know, historically, um, these kind of large gatherings um, have been shown to be able to seed um, outbreaks or larger waves of uh, infectious disease uh, cases. And so, you know, while certainly there are, there are some really important societal issues that are need, needing to be discussed with, with and, and are being focused on with these um, uh, protests, um, the fear that... Um, this is going to spark more transmission of the virus is certainly there. So we've seen, obviously, these protests um, taking place in cities across the country. Are there particular hot spots that you're most concerned about? Well, there are several cities that, um, you know, certainly um, are, are still having increased numbers of cases. I think Washington, D.C. is one example of that. Um, and I think urban centers are always ones um, that are a little bit more of, have a more potential for having hotbed because of the uh, increased population density that's there. Um, and so all these uh, uh, protests that are going on in cities represent those areas that uh, we're most concerned about having these flare-ups of, of, uh, of cases. When will we know in the data whether uh, this lack of social distancing many nights over the last few days is translating into a new wave of infection? Well, you know, it really takes about um, a week to two weeks before we start to see the true um, numbers of cases from these events. So, again, I would imagine that we were going to be following this over the next one or one to two weeks to see if we're seeing a spike that correlates with some of these things. Where are we in terms of testing right now? We've heard that uh, the level of uh, testing across the country has gotten to about uh, two and a half million a week. Is that a, a, a level that you'd like to see that makes you comfortable about uh, just the, the general reopening aside uh, from from the unrest that we've seen? You know, we're working towards a, towards a good testing capability. Um, you know, the more testing we have, the more we'll be able to sort of ease restrictions because then we'll be able to monitor the numbers of cases much more carefully. So testing combined with increasing our ability to do this contact tracing to find individuals who've been exposed to a person who's known to be infected, 